So welcome and good evening. My name is Samir Gandesha and I'm a professor here in the Department of Global Humanities at uh, SFU and also director of um, SFU's Institute for the Humanities, which is one of the proud sponsors of this uh, second annual um, Chin Banerjee uh, lecture in anti-racism. Um, along with, uh, amongst other uh, partners, the uh, Hari Sharma Foundation. And we've done a lot of work uh, together with Hari Sharma. Yeah, and uh, I just wanted to, um, before I go any further, um, acknowledge that we are in the ancestral and unceded territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Um, and uh, just a word about last year's uh, lecture, which took place around the same time, it was last last October, um, and it was just a, a phenomenal inaugural uh, lecture by Robin Maynard. And uh, we had then following that uh, about a 20 minute sort of dialogue between Robin and, and uh, Glenn Coltart from, from UBC. And then we had an open discussion. It was really a fascinating evening. And we do have a recording of that event if people are, are interested. Um, and of course, we're also going to be recording this event. So for those people who might have wanted to come tonight but couldn't make it, you can let them know that uh, um, the recording will be available in a, in a, in a couple, of, couple of weeks or so. Um, we're also hoping in the future to get uh, Professor Paul Gilroy um, from the United Kingdom uh, to come and speak. He's done a lot of work on racism, anti-racism. Um, he's, of course, uh, uh, the author of a very important book from well, about 30 years ago now uh, on the Black Atlantic, uh, which documents the profound contributions um, uh, of African peoples uh, to um, Western modernity. Um, quite an interesting, in a way, uh, repost or, or response to um, Afro-pessimism, which is um, you know, gaining increasing traction today in, in, the, in the halls of the academy and in, in, the, uh, in art, art uh, institutions, museums and galleries and so on. So I think this is a, be interesting to have, uh, have Paul um, uh, here next, uh, next year, if possible. Um, but it's a, a great honor, um, uh, a privilege, and a pleasure to have uh, Shama Savant here with us to deliver the second uh, annual lecture. And then the um, format is that we will have a uh, bit of a round table immediately following, and then we'll open it up for discussion. And that's really crucial. We want to have an opportunity for, for you all to, to participate um, in a dialogue um, with uh, both Councillor Savant and also um, the uh, members of the, uh, the round table. So it, it's uh, additionally um, uh, a, a privilege to be able to introduce to you um, uh, Stephen von Soschowski, who is the president of the Vancouver and District Labor Council, uh, to come up and formally introduce um, uh, Shama. So, um, Stephen, welcome. It's good to have you with us. Good evening, everyone. Um, so as was mentioned, I'm Stefan von Sichowski. I'm the president of the Vancouver and District Labor Council. And uh, really honored to be here uh, this evening um, to introduce uh, our keynote speaker, Shama Sawant. I should say a few words about um, the Labor Council, although I know uh, there's uh, it's a room of friends. And many of you are probably well aware of the Labor Council and, and what it is and what it does. but. Just for anyone who's not, um, we were founded in 1889 uh, as the Vancouver Trades and Labor Congress um, and currently represent just under 90 affiliated local unions, approximately 60,000 union members across the Metro Vancouver region, um, focusing on labor education, political action, and uh, really just bringing the labor movement together uh, to have one voice uh, on the issues that matter to working people here in the region. Um, it's really my honor to, to be here tonight and in, introduce uh, Shama Swant, uh, the first elected Seattle City Council um, member of, who is a socialist in nearly a century. I think that does deserve a round of applause. 
and uh, originally elected in 2013. Um, Shama has won four elections now uh, without the help of corporate donations or money. And she's used her elected office to fight for the working class, including making Seattle the first major city to gain a $15 minimum wage in 2014. <laughs> there will be a lot of clapping if you're going to clap every time that she did something good, because let me tell you, it's a list. Um, the Amazon tax in 2020, which funds affordable housing uh, and Green New Deal programs. She worked, at, she worked with Starbucks workers to win a unanimous city council resolution in 2022 to support the Starbucks union drive. And she was the only council member to vocally stand with Seattle's grocery workers fighting to keep their $4 an hour pandemic hazard pay after the COVID-19 pandemic. She also spearheaded landmark renters' rights provisions, such as a six-month notice for rent increases, mandating landlords to pay relocation assistance of three months' rent upon forcing tenants to leave due to rent increases over 10%, and a ban on evictions in winter months, um, as well as a ban on evictions of school children and public school workers during the school year, which I just thought were such amazing and important initiatives and really something for us to think about here in this region with the crisis that we know we also have in affordable housing and rental availability. In addition to all of this, Shama has a long track record of building a united working class struggle against discrimination and oppression. For example, replacing Seattle's Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day. <laughs> Winning a, band, uh, a ban rather, on caste discrimination an initiative that's now starting to make the rounds here locally as well. And I'm proud to say our Labor Council has endorsed that initiative uh, and will be encouraging our affiliates to do the same. As well as making, a, making Seattle an abortion sanctuary. And those who are familiar following US politics know uh, that there are serious threats uh, to reproductive rights in that country today. And banning police use of chokeholds, chemical weapons, and so-called crowd control devices as well. well they say the best way to judge a person is on their actions. And I think based on these actions, we have a pretty amazing uh, person coming up here to speak to us now today. And so, without further ado, I'd like you to please welcome Councillor Shama Swant. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, everyone, for being here. We're meeting in uh, we're, 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 we're meeting to discuss the question of racism and oppression at a time when there is a bloodbath going on in Gaza, instigated by the Israeli state with the funding and support of U.S. and Western imperialism. Uh, people may have heard the ground offensive is essentially already underway to some degree, and the Israeli Prime Minister, right-wing reactionary Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, has roundly rejected the call for a ceasefire. Most of the corporate media, which are the mouthpieces for the interests of the billionaire class internationally, portray the Israel-Palestine conflict as an unavoidable clash born out of religious and ethnic hatred. And the Israeli and US states say, and Western imperialism, including the Canadian regime, is complicit in this as well, say that the only solution to the crisis is the obliteration of Hamas. And I'll come back to this point in a bit. But in reality, uh, even a cursory study of the history of the region shows that, it, that it's the Israeli state's brutal occupation, state violence, and apartheid-like policies that are at the root of this crisis. Repeated war and bloodshed has only created a worsening of the situation. Hamas, for example, was sponsored by the Israeli state as a counterweight to left Palestinian nationalism 
which the Israeli ruling class feared. Similarly, the US support for the Mujahideen in Afghanistan fighting the Soviet military led directly to the creation of Al-Qaeda, which created the conditions for 9-11. Imperialism always leads to blowback and ordinary people pay the price. So in other words, as a socialist, I do not believe that oppression is inevitable to human society. The oppression of specific communities, peoples, and nations is part and parcel of everything that plays out under class society and obviously currently under global capitalism. Capitalism's logic is to ensure greater and greater wealth consolidation in the hands of a smaller and smaller elite through the exploitation of the vast majority of ordinary people, the working class and the poor. It, and it does this by oppressing and expropriating the lion's share of the wealth created by the working class. But because the capitalists are completely outnumbered a million times over, they necessarily have to use various mechanisms of divide and conquer to prevent the emergence of a powerful, united, working class movement which could challenge their rule. These means of divide and conquer come in many forms, including racial and ethnic discrimination and oppression, women's oppression, national oppression as we're seeing uh, in the Israel-Palestine conflict, uh, and even regional divisions within a nation. U.S. capitalism has in particular relied on the vicious oppression of the black population throughout its history, and there will be no end to capitalist exploitation in the United States without a united challenge to anti-black racism. As Karl Marx famously said, labor in the white skin can never free itself as long as labor in the black skin is branded, and that was in reference to the US, um, the Civil War, U.S. Civil War. Oppression will not disappear unless the working class and the oppressed fight for a society that is free of the need for exploitation of the masses. In my view, that is a socialist society. But that does not mean that the fight against racism or sexism or transphobia or any other oppression is somehow delayed, you know, kept at bay uh, uh, until we win, supposedly have this fantasy that we're going to win the fight against economic exploitation. In reality, as a socialist, I believe the fight against all forms of oppression has to go hand in hand with the fight to win gains for working class and oppressed people in the present. A working class fight back has to be on a program of demands that explicitly addresses specific oppressions, such as racism, alongside the economic exploitation that is the unified experience of the working class. This has been part of the basis of the political ideas of Socialist Alternative US and Canada, our organization, and of International Socialist Alternative, which is the international organization that we are affiliated with. And it's not only evident, and I'll talk about this, in our work in the Seattle City Council, but in our work as a whole in the US, in Canada, and internationally, including inside the labor movement. In my first year in office in 2014, and Stefan mentioned this, we made Seattle one of the first cities to end Columbus Day and replacing it with in the Indigenous People's Day. The story behind this is that Indigenous people had brought this resolution again and again over many years to self-described Democrats on the city council and been met with total silence, despite the fact that it was a resolution which would have cost the city nothing. It's just a statement, but it's an important statement. And to win that statement, you know, to, to win even this condemnation on paper, condemnation of the barbaric and genocidal policies against indigenous people and the disgusting tradition of celebrating Columbus and imperialism, it took a socialist to be elected. Also in 2014, we, I, I don't know how many of you were, you know, are old enough to remember, but in 2014, in, in the summer, Israel had carried out a major offensive against Gaza and at the time, not a single Democrat was willing to speak up and demand that Obama should withdraw military support and you know, act that US Congress should actually oppose the, the devastation that was being wreaked on the Palestinian people. Our city council office, our socialist office was the only one, it stood out um, that, that we sent a public statement which all the Democrats refused to sign on to. And um, I don't know if I've mentioned or, or how many of you know this, but this is, this is going to be a running theme in everything I'm going to say. In the city council, you know, Stefan mentioned we are the only socialists in, this, you know, in 100 years. Uh, but if you look at the composition of the city council, it's nine council members. I am one socialist. The eight others are Democrat. There's no Republican Party. Uh, 
There's no, you know, you can't play the lesser evilism card here. The Democrats are the evil. And, it, and despite being not only, a, you know, the decisively a Democratic majority, and despi despite being uh, mostly self-described progressives, actually, because the consciousness, working class consciousness in Seattle is well to the left of the city council. So it forces them to at least in name, in words, profess progressiveness. And despite all of that, it has taken one socialist office, you know, re really bringing ordinary people together to win some of these victories. And these are, these are unheard of victories. In 2016, Black Lives Matter activists in Seattle organized a campaign they called Block the Bunker, which was to stop the construction of what would have been the most expensive police precinct compo compound in the country to the tune of $160 million. They did this in the context of attacks on social services and the growing backlash against racism and police violence targeting black working class people and poor people and the wider working class and activists, not to mention uh, uh, homeless uh, community members. We supported this movement, we meaning my office, Socialist Alternative, we supported this movement and played a central role in defeating the bunker, meaning the mayor, the Democratic mayor and the Democratic City Council and the Chamber of Commerce, they were all forced to withdraw. To, to date, that police bunker of $160 million has not been built because of the massive opposition that we brought to bear. But we didn't stop there. We said that if they had $160 million to spend on this bunker, then they should be spending that on affordable housing. And we used... We used the momentum of, of the victory of Block the Bunker to then uh, uh, launch a Build a Thousand Homes demand in our People's Budget Campaign, which we have done annually and won many victories out of. And out of the $160 million, we were able to win $29 million. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and in the story of why, you might ask, why did we win only $29 million? What, what happened to the rest of the money? Why, why, didn't, why weren't we able to win that? I think that uh, the answer to that question has to be in the kind of leadership we have in social movements, and I'm going to come to that, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, repeat that story here, but it's the same story in each of these struggles. In February 2020, we won the nation's first resolution condemning the anti-Muslim citizenship laws, anti-Muslim and really anti-poor citizenship laws by the reactionary regime of Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his right-wing, you know, Hindutva, Vadi, Bharatiya Janata Party. In 2020, in the midst of the George Floyd protests, we won an absolutely historic legislation banning the use by Seattle police, uh, use or purchase by Seattle police of chemical weapons, including tear gas, mace, pepper spray, and also rubber bullets, bean bags, water cannons, and sonic and ultrasonic weapons. And the other legislation we won alongside that is um, the ch ban of uh, choke, use of chokeholds by the police. And obviously, people know that's how George Floyd lost his life. Later that same year, in 2020, we won the Amazon tax that Stefan mentioned. And also in 2020, we helped spearhead a movement that, uh, that forced the Martin Luther King County Labor Council, which is the lo re local regional labor council, to expel the Seattle Police Officers Guild which is a union in name. But what we said is that you can't build a labor movement unless you understand that an injury to one is an injury to all. You cannot say you're a labor union if your members are deployed as organs of the capitalist state to oppress and injure and kill ordinary people who are our brothers and sisters and siblings in the labor movement. And that was a landmark decision that was taken because rank and file workers fought alongside us, rank and file union members fought alongside us, and it forced the leadership, forced the hand of the leadership of the Labor Council. And in February this year, we won the world's first ban on caste discrimination outside India. Many of our key victories, while they did not apply specifically to oppressed groups, which obviously the preceding ones did, but to the wider working class as a whole, did have a disproportionate positive impact on communities of color. Stefan mentioned 15. You know, at the time, obviously, things have now gone past that, and we really need at least $25 an hour. But at the time, the $15 an hour victory lifted 100,000 workers in Seattle above the poverty line 
and disproportionately, obviously, it, it had a positive impact on black workers. Uh, we have won four elections as a socialist, and in December this year, we will be leaving office undefeated despite all the forces being brought to bear against us, the democratic establishment, the Chamber of Commerce, and Jeff Bezos himself, corporations like Amazon, Starbucks, Meta, all of these corporations uh, joining together with the Democrats in order to try and defeat us. And it's not, we, we, don't, we don't say this as, as a matter of self-praise. Self we take analysis and discussion of ideas and strategy extremely seriously because we feel that's part of the backbone of building any movement. And I think it is important for us to understand why is it that this one small Seattle City Council office in this you know, relatively small city, why is it that this office, 10 years since we were first elected, is still the example of an unparalleled record? How is it that since us, we had Bernie Sanders' two runs, we had AOC and other squad members being elected, we have had a, oh, nearly 200 elected officials who won their campaigns by running as Democratic Socialists of America candidate, and yet, now, 10 years later, our office stands as almost the sole example. I think it is, first of all, important to understand that what we have achieved is impossible as just as an, an individual. Socialist alternatives, political ideas, and the organization that we have of our members has been crucial and really imperative for us to be able to use our office as a platform to build social movements, build fighting movements, and that is the only reason we have won. You know, uh, sometimes our enemies are the ones who give us the best compliments. And uh, one time, uh, a few years ago, one of the main real estate lobbyists, and he, um, he's you know, very connected with the democratic establishment, he retired, and on retire, upon retiring, you know, he was more willing to be honest, more honest in public, and he said that you know, we, we, meaning the corporate real estate lobbyists, some of the real scum of the earth, they, <laughs> they spent a lot of time and energy and money you know, donating to the campaigns of Democrats, schooling them behind the scenes on how they should vote, meaning no on the renters' rights victories that Stefan was recounting. And he said that we would tell them what to do, they would say yes, and then they would go into chambers and then be faced with what he called Sawan's army, and then all of them would crumble and the renters would win their victory. And I, and I share that uh, anecdote, again, not, not as, as, a, as, a, as an element of bragging, but to explain that he, as an agent of the ruling class, understood that the reason we were successful in exposing and shaming the Democrats into doing the right thing, even though they didn't agree with us, they just had, were forced to do it because their political careers are on the line when you pack City Hall with hundreds of people saying, you don't have the right to call yourself progressive if you vote no on this legislation. You know, bringing that defiance into City Hall, he understood and he was willing to admit that that is what it took for us to defeat the real estate lobby, which is otherwise, you know, seems, you know, that you can't defeat them. And so that is the, that's a, just to bring to life what we mean when we say building fighting movements, that's what we concretely mean. The Democratic Party has some real differences from the Republican Party. As many of you know, the Republican Party is openly right-wing, openly anti-poor and anti-immigrant, and obviously a whole section of them have gone much further to the right uh, in the era of Trumpism. The Democratic Party is more progressive on some issues, but nonetheless has lots in common with the Republicans. They are just as loyal to the interests of the billionaire class and the wealthy as are the Republicans. And the, the, Demo and the Democrats, you know, really are, they are more rhetoric than substance, and they really, really do not like to take a stand on any genuinely progressive issues that big business opposes, or even something that big business and the edifice of capitalism perceives as even a distant threat, unless they're forced to by movements of working people, as, as we've done. And so that's what we've done. We have used our office in a fundamentally different way than Democrats and Republicans. And so, you know, it, I, I think it, it's important. One of the messages, I think, from uh, our experience that needs to be taken is, and you know, in 10 years hence, after all these progressives and socialists being elected, is that it is not, for, for working class people, to be able to use elected positions to make real substantive prog progress for ourselves and you know, successfully fight the billionaire class, 
It is not a game of numerical, you know, it's not a game of numbers, like, oh, get more people elected. It, it doesn't matter how many people you get elected, if they're not willing to fight for you and they're not willing to use their office in the way we have used, it doesn't matter how many of them get elected. And look at how just having one, we have one office, we have made, you know, we have moved mountains. And so just to, again, explain concretely some of the things that are different about us, I am not a career politician. I did not, I was telling some of the people last night, I did not wake up one day and say, I'm gonna run for office. Socialist Alternative is a genuinely democratic organization. I am one of the members of Socialist Alternative. And our members discuss, debate, and vote on what campaigns to run, whether it should be an electoral campaign, uh, what the campaign platform should be, and who the candidate should be if it's an electoral campaign. We're not an electoral machine who just pop up out of the woodwork every election year. We are working class people. Many of our members are rank and file union members. Some of those are actually present right here uh, from Socialist Alternative Canada. We are part of the working class, and occasionally we might decide to run for office. Our elected representatives, whether in labor or in city council or wherever, are accountable to our membership and to the working class that Socialist Alternative as a whole is accountable to. And so we, as elected representatives, have an obligation to use our office to fight for working and oppressed people. We're also different in that I take home only the average worker's wage and donate the rest of my six-figure salary after taxes to union strike actions and social justice movements. All of this... <laughs> all of this is virtually unheard of. And you know what, the, the, something that I have learned and, and we have learned through our experience at close quarters fighting the establishment is that you may even get somebody, it's, it's unheard of at this moment, but you might actually get somebody to commit to maybe giving away part of their salary. The next part that I'm going to talk about, that's where the real challenge lies, is understanding that those other politicians, you know, from the Democratic Party or Republican, whoever, that they are not your friends or colleagues. So when I went to City Hall, I didn't go in thinking, oh, these are my work colleagues and I have to get along with them. No, you have to understand that you, they are there to manage the state, the capitalist state, and, uh, and stand up for the, you know, they are, they are lieutenants for the interests of the ruling class. We are there to fight workers. These interests are diametrically opposed. So by definition, they are not your colleagues. If anything, they are probably going to be your arch enemies, depending on what positions they take, obviously. Um, and so we do not go into City Hall seeking common ground with the representatives of big business. We base ourselves on what the working class needs and how we can build a fight back in the working class. And so going in, we expect to see relentless opposition from the Democratic Party. And, and I can tell you, they have not disappointed us in that. <laughs> I would be completely incapable of fighting for working people and the oppressed if I based myself on relationships with politicians and made backroom deals with big business. Uh, but you know, then as I said, this is where the crux lies. I don't know so how many of you, I mean, you, obviously you're, you're Canadian, so I don't expect you to, have, to be tuned into every detail of US politics, but one of the things that AOC was confronted with, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the star squad member who got elected as a socialist and DSA member, she was asked, you know, after the MAGA Republicans, the very Freedom Caucus Republicans, they were able to do literally what, what AOC was being asked by us, by the left to do, which is force the vote, you know, uh, hold the speakership vote for hostage in order to get what they want. A few years ago, the left was urging, left and rank and file workers were urging AOC to do that except for the good of humanity, meaning hold your, withhold your vote for Nancy Pelosi, don't just give her your vote for free because Nancy Pelosi is uh, completely, you know, she is a, uh, she is a, she's not just a lieutenant but a general for Wall Street. And instead of just giving her your vote for free squad members because you had the numerical balance of power, you should withhold your vote and demand progress on Medicare for all and not just force the vote on that, but also combine that by calling rallies in Washington and around the nation. And they refused to do that. Uh, but after the MAGA Republicans did it, she got questioned, correctly so, by people. How come they did it and you didn't? And her response, which was unusually honest, was that, well, you know, uh, you could do that, but then you will cause a lot of relational harm. This is a quote. She said relational harm. And what she, she didn't explain it, but what she meant by that is that if you do that, if you stand up publicly 
and call out the shamefulness of the Democrats who are enemies of the working class, who have refused to pass anything even basic as $15 an hour, let alone something substantive like Medicare for all, then they will go after you relentlessly. So every day, every day of your life that you are in the halls of power, in the halls of government, whether it is you know, the house, whatever, floor, or city, city hall, they will make your life a living hell because you've made yourself a target. But you need to do that. There is no universe where you get to be at peace with them and yet be true to what working people need. It doesn't work. The only way it would work is if suddenly Nancy Pelosi decided to be a friend for working people and decided to forsake her Wall Street credentials. But we are not, we're not holding our breath for that. So it's, we, don't, we, don't, we don't determine, as socialists, we don't determine the terrain of battle. The terrain is determined for us by capitalism. What is incumbent on us is to understand that that's how it is posed and to embrace that fight. Wear class struggle as a badge of honor. And that means, that means not going there thinking you're going to be friends with Pelosi, pose for a photo with her uh, for Vanity Fair cover and call her mama bear. No, you go to war against her because you owe it to the working class. And obviously, you know, just, to, just to make sure everybody understands, to the extent that any politician is willing to support working people's needs, of course we have worked alongside them. And there's been many instances of that, which is how we have drawn the balance of uh, votes towards us. We will work with any politician on any issue that is in the interest of the working class and oppressed. This is not personal. This is not some vendetta, as they would like to pretend. But we will never sell out. We will never set aside the needs of working people to keep peace with them. So you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, there's a difference there. Uh, and this is fundamentally different. And the other thing that's different also is, is that as socialists, we understand that you know, these lessons about, that I just shared about the Democrats, they apply many times over to the actual capitalist class whose interests the Democrats are representing. You know, there's not, so uh, the job of labor movement leaders, in our view, should not be what is what has come to be known as business unionism, meaning trying to find peace between the bosses and the workers. No, your job is to fight for the maximum for the workers. And so understanding that the bosses are not on your side as well. There's a third lesson, which is very little talked about because it's not obvious often, and it's also the, one of the hardest things to talk about, frankly, but it is, it, it is needed. Another thing that you need in order to be true to the working class is not, to not accept gatekeeping by other leaders in the social movement, because that happens every day of the week. When you are actually building something substantive, where you become, you meaning not personally, but you with the movement you're building become an actual threat to the elite, to, uh, to the status quo, then you will see gatekeepers emerging from all corners who are not exactly the Democrats. They are not, they're certainly not billionaires or multimillionaires, but they are also, whether they're conscious of it or not, agents of holding movement back. And so it's important to understand that we, again, base ourselves on what the rank and file are willing to fight for, not what this or that gatekeeper is happy with. So all of this, you know, the, the lessons that we have put into, um, it put into action, all of this is absolutely unique on the left. Uh, I just want to give some of some examples to explain this. So when we, when we won the chemical weapons ban and the chokehold ban, that was entirely, I mean, this is BLM, right? I'm not black. Um, you know, uh, there were many, many black leaders in Seattle, but none of them came and helped to win this. It was won entirely by our office alongside hundreds of ordinary people from start to finish. And um, no, as I said, n none of them, uh, none of the BLM NGO leaders came to uh, help this, you know, this historic, uh, help win, win this historic legislation. Certainly none of the so-called progressive Democrats were willing to support it. They ended up voting yes, but that was under pressure from the fact that we mobilized hundreds of ordinary people to demand. And that's another thing. It's not only about mobilizing hundreds of people. It's what message you send publicly. If we mobilize hundreds of people, but say, you know, you make a moral appeal to Democrats, please do this. Please do this, it's the right thing, but I support you nonetheless. That's no pressure on them. There's, no, there's got nothing to lose. 
No, what we did was we, we, as I said before, we mobilized hundreds of people and said, you don't have the right to call yourself progressive. You're exposed as not a progressive. If in the midst of all the tear gas and rubber bullets that are flying at ordinary black people on the streets of your city, you don't have the right to say that you think black lives matter because if you won't know on this, clearly to you, black lives don't matter. That is the kind of defiance and political clarity we brought to the public testimonies and that is what forced them to, uh, to, you know, to vote yes on it. You know, so it's, it's, almost like, uh, it's almost like the same story, but you know, there are some specific interesting points in each of those. Same with Tax Amazon. It was the same year during the George Floyd protests. This was uh, ultimately what we won actually is, is a remarkable thing. It, it raises $214 million annually from the richest people, you know, like the major shareholders of Amazon and other corporations, uh, the Democrats, again, were totally opposed to it. And at first, they were openly opposed to it. Uh, I just, you know, just to give you some specifics, at the time, actually it was, um, it was uh, in name majority progressive, and it was also majority, I believe at that time it was both majority women, it was a super majority of women council, and it was a majority women of color council. And two of the council members who went hard against our tax Amazon movement uh, were L Lorena Gonzalez and Teresa Mosqueda, two Latinas, self-described progressives, also you know, came from the labor movement, not, not as rank and file labor like myself, but, but you know, they had credentials from the labor leadership. They were endorsed by virtually all of the labor leadership. But these two council members together, in the name of Black Lives Matter, carried out various machinations to prevent us from making progress on the tax Amazon legislation, even going so far as to prevent me from holding a committee meeting to discuss the legislation, which is completely unprecedented, such a move. They were helped in this, unfortunately, by most of the prominent BLM leaders who uh, went around you know, among just ordinary black people in the, in the protest where we were you know, trying to get signatures on our petition saying Amazon tax is not a black issue. They, uh, you know, they started this rumor mill that black people should not trust socialist alternatives, that they should follow black leaders. So in other words, they wielded the weapon of identity politics against us in order to undermine the tax Amazon legislation. And unfortunately, another unfortunate thing is that the Democratic Socialists of America branch there tailed this black leadership and they were all sort of, you know, unfortunately, in, to some degree or another, hand in glove with that strategy of undermining this, uh, this effort. But we, we did not. See, this is a concrete example of how you could say, you could be genuine and say, well, I'm going to follow black leadership and uh, I'm going to just, shut, you know, fold the tent of tax Amazon because black people, it's not a black issue. They're telling me they, they must be the authority. We refuse to do that. See, this, this, the political clarity of whom you owe your loyalty to not these individual black people who are self-appointed leaders, who are making connections with the Democratic Party and who are influential, but the ordinary black people who are finding it increasingly hard to pay their rent in the city. And so what we said was, we're not gonna accept your gatekeeping. We're gonna go with our petition directly to ordinary black people and also you know, people of all ethnicities, uh, but Obviously, the main test was going to be how the black working class responded to us. But I cannot tell you how huge of a support we received it, uh, for it. I mean, our petition clipboards were almost flying out of our hands like, oh, yeah, you want to tax Amazon? Fuck yeah. Sorry for my language, but that's, that's actually what we heard. Uh, and so a large majority of the 30,000 signatures that we collected, and that was for a ballot initiative petition. You know, it was, it was a strategy of creating a credible threat, saying if the city council didn't pass a legislation in city hall, we are going to take it to the ballot where people, voters can directly decide. So those petition signatures mattered. And so we collected uh, 20,000 signatures in, uh, you know, in a very short time, and then after that we collected 10,000 more signatures. And uh, we were thanked repeatedly by working black working class people who said, I'm glad you understand that for us, this is not just about the police. Of course it's about that, but it's about our right to the city. We can't pay our rent and we are being pushed out and this could make a real difference in our lives. And it was when we won those 30,000 signatures is when it became a real threat 
to the democratic establishment, and suddenly they were forced to do something about it, and then, of course, they tried to co-opt it as something that they did. Similar with the demand for defund, you know, everybody knows the story. Uh, I, I assume, you know, the Democrats from New York City to Minneapolis to Seattle made promises, and then uh, at the same time, and you know, eventually they ended up um, actually playing mostly smoke and mirror tricks to end up not actually defunding the police. And I just wanted to clarify one thing is that for socialist alternative, we didn't believe that the, the demand defund the police was the most effective thing. What we had called for, for, for long was cutting the bloated police budget and also uh, demanding elected uh, oversight, elected community oversight over the police department, including hiring and firing and all other policies. Um, but we, we, but we, did because, but because the defund demand did get embraced by a section of the movement, we ended up really pushing for it, and uh, be, and the BLM leaders were calling for it. But at the end of the day, unfortunately, instead of fighting for their own demand, they instead ended up cutting a deal with the Democratic Party, uh, where uh, you know, and, and this was sort of the nexus between the Democratic Party politicians and. NGO figureheads. This is straight out of the Democratic Party playbook. They, the, they rely on NGO figureheads repeatedly whenever there is movement pressure on them. And uh, so despite being the largest protest movement, you know, street protest movement in US history, unfortunately, the movement's um, lack of clear leadership structures where the leaders could be held accountable, which they couldn't be because there weren't any structures in the movement, Despite being such a historic protest, it actually left it vulnerable to the Democratic Party co-optation. And now, if we do a balance sheet of what the, the BLM movement won, it is actually, I mean, it's not that they didn't win anything, and obviously the Amazon tax is a victory of the BLM movement, uh, but, as is the weapons ban, but um, it's, the victories are nowhere near commensurate with the, the size of the movement, the power of the movement, and I think uh, that's very uh, important for us to, uh, you know, examine in a very serious way. So what, what happened specifically? The BLM leaders developed relationships with Democratic politicians, and in return for not building a fighting campaign on defund, the NGO leaders won millions of dollars for their own careers, including getting six-figure salary jobs and funding for their own NGOs which will, I mean, it will do something, but it will not accomplish anything close to what could be transformative for black people, not to mention the uh, lessons that can be learned. I mean, right now, if you, if you talk to ordinary people, especially young black people in America, there is a feeling of demoralization, and it's, and it's a, I mean, we should not be demoralized, but it's based on their accurate re realization that BLM failed to win the victories it could win, and they know they were sold out by the leaders. And so the betrayal is not only, betrayals don't come only in the form of a refusal to fight, it all, it all comes in the form of a careerist alignment with the democratic establishment, and it comes in the aggressive wielding of the weapon of identity politics, which obviously we know is a weapon of choice of uh, corporations, of capitalism. And we've seen this again and again, uh, we, uh, the ideas being disseminated by the capitalist class have used this element uh, quite a bit. I mean, they, uh, they talk about racism, but then they talk about how, they talk about, you know, this or that person, this CFO is black, or this officer in Starbucks, the diversity, equity, and inclusion officer in Starbucks Corporation. I'm not making this up. She actually, I, I don't know if she's still there, but uh, when, when the union drive was in its heyday, unfortunately it's in decline, but when it was in its heyday, um, the, the diversity, equity, inclusion officer of Starbucks actually a black woman, black corporate woman, was used as a weapon against the union drive. Talking about how this won't be good for workers of color. I mean, that's how insidious it can get. And so the idea of privilege being based on race, gender, sexuality is a major feature of this sort of corporate wokeism or corporate identity politics, uh, these DEI initiatives and all of that. And, uh, and there's, all, there's a lot of buzz around you know, let's make our board members of NASDAQ more diverse. I mean, do you know, do you, I mean, do you know what that means? I mean, NASDAQ, I mean, this is Wall Street. The, these are the power brokers of global capitalism. 
So what does it mean to have one or two black people that, who are going to carry out the same agenda uh, against working people and disproportionately against the black people? And so you know, that doesn't mean we don't favor integration in workplaces and uh, affirmative action. In fact, uh, we have a long, Socialist Alternative has a long track record of strongly supporting affirmative action, including the reservation system in India, which you know, those of you from South Asia will know what I'm talking about. Uh, because those do help. I mean, they don't go as far as it, they need to, but they are progressive measures and, uh, and we don't oppose them. But we also feel it's our duty to point out that we cannot let corporations use that as a way to push back against the real progress that needs to be made in society. Um, and I think one, one concerning thing that has happened because of the reluctance of many of the leaders to fight in the way that we have done is, and, in, and, and I don't just mean in the social movement, this uh, unfortunately applies uh, quite a bit in the labor movement as well. And as I said, you know, there's business unionism and there's class struggle unionism. And I think we, we have seen for decades, especially in the US, but to, to a lesser degree in other countries, including Canada as well, where uh, for the last several decades, there's been a real a decline in the labor movement because of the assault of neoliberalism and, and the Reagan-Thatcher era, all of that, you know, the history goes far back. And so for generations of labor leaders, they've made their peace with this idea of business unionism, where, as I said, you know, they, they feel like their job is to manage uh, triage between all of these different entities. But really what we need is class struggle unionism because the history of the labor movement, no matter which country you pick, shows that it is that kind of fighting militant strategy that actually is able to win victories. And you know, there are, uh, obviously if we don't adopt a class struggle strategy, we can't win the kind of victories we want to win. But the dangers go beyond that, right? What, what are we seeing uh, with the rise of Trumpism, the, the much more unfortunately developed situation in India with the, you know, the, all the institutions of capitalism circling around Narendra Modi and just a chilling atmosphere being instilled uh, in India and now the, the sedition charges against Arundhati Kiro. I mean, the fact that the Modi regime is emboldened enough to bring this charge against Arundhati Roy after all these years is, um, it's a bellwether to, you know, it's the canary in the coal mine. It, it tells you that they are emboldened because things have gone that far that they feel that they can get away with it. And obviously it's our job to not let them get away with this. But uh, but the moral of this story is that the failure of social and labor movement leadership to harness these massive protests, harness the anger in society, to win substantive victories, to learn the lessons, collectively learn the lessons of social struggle from history, from our own struggle, and then apply those lessons to future uh, movements uh, and uh, you know, to win future victories, all of this failure is not only meaning that we don't win the victories, but it's also created a historic opening for backlash from the right. And uh, you know, one, some concrete examples of this in the US and even locally is, we've seen the capitalist state go on the offensive after BLM uh, to, in fact, literally calling it refund law enforcement. I mean, they're so emboldened now, they literally call it, we need to refund law enforcement after the whole defund movement. And, um, you know, with, there are lots of examples in, in, um, in the US with Eric Adams, the black mayor of New York, who's actually now not only brought a law and order rhetoric, but also now is going against immigrants uh, and calling them um, uh, something like the greatest danger or something like that. Uh, it's so, you know, it's, it's pretty, pretty terrible. But we're, we're seeing this in Vancouver itself, right? Vancouver's Chinese Canadian mayor, Ken Sim, and his right-wing ABC party, I mean, they are obviously openly anti-working class, anti-poor. He's Chinese Canadian, but he has enact, enacted anti-homeless policies. Um, obviously, I'm telling you all what you already know. Cancel the living wage policy for public sector city workers, uh, all of that. And, and in fact, I was d d um, talking a little bit about this with some members of Socialist Alternative here, and it's clear that it's actually going to disproportionately affect uh, the, some of the most underpaid women workers of color in cleaning, catering, and so on. So talk about uh, you know, being a person of color mayor and then being uh, somebody who has carried out these policies. And then we're seeing uh, you know, mayor, the mayors of Calgary and Edmonton who are Indo-Canadian and they're you know, indigenous politicians who want to drill for oil. 
uh, and so on and so on. I mean, the examples just abound. Um, so uh, I think um, it's important for us to understand that if we're going to talk about privilege, the privilege that we need to talk about is not between working, white working people and black working people, uh, but understanding that all of us, do, not, not that racism isn't real, it absolutely is, and it is horrific, and especially in the United States, anti-black racism is, has, has a specific barbaric history. And even today, black men are being lynched. Black men are eight times more like, black, innocent black men are eight times more likely than white men to be wrongfully accused of rape. I mean, it is, it is horrendous. However, the only, or in, it's not even however, especially because of that, our obligation is to understand that the only way we can fight against oppression is to unite people on the demands related to oppression and also around economic exploitation. And, um, uh, and so in other words, if we're gonna talk about privilege, we, we have to talk about the uh, unimaginable asymmetry between all of us working people and the few billionaires and really now trillionaires at the top. That's the privilege asymmetry that we have to talk about. Uh, and I think uh, this obligation rests on all of us, you know, the obligation to have this political analysis that can bring together working people on a principled basis. It lies with all leaders, whether you're elected or not, whether you're in labor or city hall or not, all of this is important. I just want to end on a couple of things. One is, uh, some of you may have heard Democratic Governor Gavin Newsom just vetoed the bill to ban caste discrimination in California. It is a setback, it's a serious setback, because you know, Seattle was a huge victory, and it still is, and now it's, it's not, right now it's the beacon. But this is California. You know, if we could have won in California, this could have been a tremendous step forward that I'm sure would have spearheaded other victories around the world. This is a, it is, now it's incumbent on us to understand why this happened. I know people will say things like, well, Seattle is a small, it's a small city, you can do things in small cities, but you can't do it in big states, you can't do it in Congress. I'm sorry, that's hogwash. That, that has nothing to do with reality. The reality is that you need to have a clear strategy to win. And the, one of the fundamental differences between the activists in, uh, in the Seattle fight versus the lead activists or NGO leaders in, not, not, I'm not talking about the rank and file activists, some of you who are here, uh, and I, you know, I was also one of them. I'm talking about the leaders who were very close to the Democratic Party politicians in California. They put their faith in the Democratic Party. We did the opposite. We, did, we went in understanding that the Democrats are not on our side, and the way we will win them, uh, win their votes, is by putting pressure on them and, and, and you know, putting real pressure on their political careers, which is how we won. They really did not want it. I mean, if I had the time, I would tell you some of the things that they said to me in the privacy of the city hall hallway. But it's, you know, that strategy matters. And the other thing that matters is political analysis. One of the things that we were trying to convey to the lead NGO leaders in California when the caste fight was going on is that actually here you have more stacked against you because for the democratic establishment to give in in a state like California, I mean, you know, this is like a country, that's a much more at stake for them. So they are going to fight harder there. And furthermore, it was happening in the midst of the Narendra Modi visit and you know, he was giving, being given a red carpet welcome in Washington DC. And it's happening in the midst of uh, the new Cold War, where the US-led bloc and the China-Russia-led bloc are fighting each other for advantage. And Modi, as Biden himself has said, is one of the linchpins. And so the democratic establishment in the US is loath, is loath to go against Modi right now because they, they, want, they have their own geostrategic interest at hand, which does not include working people in India or working people in the US. None of us are part of that equation. It's, it's, their, it's their fight, this is what happens in imperialism. And so we were warning them that expect Newsom to veto this because he is part of that democratic elite where they are not going to want to go against Modi and also the rising Hindutva agenda in the United States as well. And so this betrayal was not just by Newsom, it was by all Democrats, and it was a concession to the Modi regime in the context of the new Cold War. The, you know, they completely refused to build a defiant movement, the NGO leaders, and now we are paying the price. So I think, um, I think that, I mean, obviously this is not the end of the story, 
but it will be the end if we don't learn the lessons. And so why Seattle won and why California lost is not a regional difference, it's a political difference. It's a difference in analysis and strategy. And I think we have an, uh, an, an incredible opportunity to lead the way, you know, after Seattle, after the California debacle, to lead the way in British Columbia. I hope everybody takes this uh, leaflet from Socialist Alternative. We have people uh, back there, uh, alongside many of the South Asian activists who are present here and organizations. We've been trying to build momentum to help British Columbia win the, you know, BC, uh, win the, you know, in the US everybody says British Columbia. <laughs> uh, they don't say BC. Uh, help BC win this uh, legislation, and, and this will be huge. I mean, if we can win this in BC, this will m make up for the defeat in California and then set the stage for future things. And it's really important to hear that the Vancouver District Labor Council has already passed a resolution that deserves an applause, of course. Um, and I wanted to thank uh, Dominic, who is sitting back there, who's a teacher, public school teacher, and who uh, helped pass the resolution before that to uh, the, uh, the New West uh, Teachers Union. Uh, so we really need the BC uh, Federation of Labor to push for this. And I think we need, uh, based on that, we need a big mobilization to Victoria. And, you know, I, I, I won't make an uh, equivalency between the, the Democratic Party and the NDP because obviously there are some differences here. But I think at the same time, we cannot put our faith in the NDP. We've, we've seen how. Uh, what, what they did with Anjali Padurai, and we, you know, we've seen their unwillingness to fight. And in fact, you know, we've held rallies in BC uh, for, you know, in favor of this bill uh, that we want to pass in BC. And I have personally reached out, socialist alternative people in the movement have reached out to the many sick MPs, and they, they've all you know, paid lip service, but not one of them has said, I'm going to take this up and fight for this. So I don't think we can put our faith in the NDP. I don't think we can put our faith on uh, say, uh, politicians, whether they're Sikh or Hindu or whatever. We need fighters, and those fighters are amongst us inside the movement. And so uh, hopefully we can get this passed in the BC Federation and also um, you know, take a big rally to Victoria and force them to pass in the legislature. Shama, thank you so much. Uh, what an inspiring talk uh, on many levels. Um, the first one being, you know, really uh, documentation of uh, all that uh, SA has done in, in Seattle and Seattle City Council. Uh, insight into tactics and strategy, which I was certainly taking note of. And I think this idea of, of dual power is really crucial, that you are both uh, working hard and fighting um, class struggle within the chambers, but you're doing so on the basis of a, a popular mobilization outside. And I think this is so important, and I think it gives us a sense, perhaps, um, of what an institute like ours can do. Because I think you talked a, a little bit right at the beginning about building political consciousness. There's political consciousness in, this, in the city, and you can use that as a basis for, for mobilization to get these um, uh, demands met um, and to fight back. I think this is really crucial. So we, in a sense, can do this. And the Institute has been around for 40 years now. This is our 40th um, anniversary year. And uh, we have um, done a lot of uh, work that intersects with many of the things that you, you spoke about. I won't take too much time in this, but I'll just point out a couple of things. Um, we've had uh, an ongoing uh, relationship with the Chetna Association, which fights against caste depression. Um, and with them, we've put into place a um, BR Embedkar Memorial Lecture. And that's been going for close to a, a decade. And this is very, very important work. So that intersects with uh, um, uh, your calls for mobilization here in, in, in BC. What you were saying about the Democratic Party can't um, but resonate here in, in, in Canada, um, not just in BC and the, 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 the conflicts and problems in the BC NDP, but I think as everybody's aware with Sarah Jama in, uh, in Ontario, in the Ontario NDP, expelled from caucus simply because she registered um, the horrific suffering uh, of the Palestinian people. Um, this is just unconscionable that our supposedly progressive party um, has decided 
unequivocally uh, with the state of Israel in this, in this conflict. And this is just uh, absolutely uh, unacceptable as far as I'm concerned. And I'm sure uh, as far as we are all concerned. Um, a couple of other things. I mean, I, I, th I think one of the, the, the truly uh, brilliant aspects of your talk was, a, was not only the, the, the um, um, very well taken criticism of the deleterious effects uh, of, uh, of identity politics, how it can scupper and, and, um, and really um, drive fissures into the labor movement uh, and um, really obviate the, the importance of class struggle. Um, but the examples you gave were really profound and powerful and ones that I, I will uh, use in my own work. We've done a lot of critical analysis um, of identity politics at the Institute precisely for the reasons that you are pointing out because it, um, it really has an undermining effect. It can have an undermining effect on, uh, on class solidarity. So thank you again and I'm really looking forward to, uh, to our discussion now. So if I could just call the, the, um, the panelists up um, to uh, begin our short roundtable discussion um, and then we will open it up for uh, a broader discussion. Um, um, I would also, just before we go um, uh, forward with, with the introductions of, uh, of our esteemed panel, um, uh, I just want to um, I just want to say uh, that this event is not only co-hosted with Hari Sharma, but also Toronto, uh, sorry, Toronto, Vancouver and District Labour Council. Um, and I'm also very pleased to see Harman de Kale uh, from the uh, BC Federation of Labour in the audience. Thanks for being with us. It's really special to have you here. Um, so I think we'll proceed in the order in which the speakers are listed, the panelists are listed. Uh, so I'll just introduce you all and then we can we can proceed. Um, so our, our first speaker I'm very pleased to, to say is Anjali Apadurai, who is a climate justice organizer and campaigner. I think virtually everybody in the room uh, uh, I'm sure knows uh, Anjali, but I will introduce her nonetheless. She got her start organizing youth movements from around the world to ensure that Global South social movements demands were heard in the halls of power. Today, Anjali is campaigns director at the Climate Emergency Unit and runs the Padma Center for Climate Justice, a project that brings together diasporic communities to build power around issues of climate and economic justice. Anjali is also engaged with the electoral system, running as an NDP candidate in the 2021 federal election as a candidate in the 2022 um, BC NDP leadership race. Um, so that's Anjali and Michael Ma is a faculty member in the Department of Criminology at, at uh, Kwantlen Polytechnic University uh, here in BC. He works in the areas of social justice, community advocacy, anti-racism, and harm reduction. His current research is in the area of, of drug use. He is a founding member of the Social Justice Center and a current member of the Vancouver District Labor Council. In the past, he was very active with the Chinese Canadian uh, National Council, the Toronto chapter, and the Metro Network for Social Justice. His academic training is in sculpture, art history, and social political thought. Um, Michael is also a member of the West Coast Coalition uh, Against Racism, um, or WCAR, which also, I believe, has a table in the back. You guys, we have a table in the back? No, we didn't. Not this time around. OK. Um, great. I, Michael and I go way back, decades. Um, so great to have you here, Michael. And last but not least, Yamini Zaidi is an organizer with the Teaching Support Staff Union and the Contract Worker Justice Coalition fighting to end the outsourcing of food and cleaning services at SFU. As a master's student in the School of Communication, she studies the evolving strategies of gig workers unions in India. So I think we'll pass the mic over to Anjali. Hello, everyone. I'm so honored to be here. I'm uh, fangirling so hard. Shama, I've admired your work for uh, just many, many years. And, um, you know, I have many questions for you. Um, like, we, we need your, your guidance and, and some of the guidance that you offered in your talk um, up here so, so badly, as you've, as you've seen with our various um, sort of clashes with... Um, 
with uh, elected power and, and, and the organized power of, um, of the elite classes. And so we've just, um, yeah, just really excited to, um, to have this discussion and, and to learn more from you. Um, was there a prompt that you wanted me to speak to, Samir, or just in general? I think um, reflecting on your own experiences um, and how those experiences intersected with some of the um, uh, the remarks that uh, the chairman was making, I think mm -hmm. that would be really interesting to hear about. Particularly, I thought the 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 hold that establishment parties such as the NDP um, have consolidated um, in certain. Um, uh, uh, aspects uh, of the left and the way they I engage in gatekeeping mm -hmm. and also a certain kind of, yeah, the, the political equivalent of, uh, of what you call um, business unionism. So not an expression of working class demands, but really a kind of management uh, of them. So mm -hmm. I think in, in kind of in, in that direction. Yeah, for sure. Um, yes, so my foray into uh, elect electoral politics was very recent, actually. Before that, I organized mostly in the environmental movement. And that, you know, there are a lot of lessons about, um, about you know, good organizing that come from the environmental movement and a lot of lessons in what not to do. Because uh, historically, um, you know, the environmental movement, specifically in North America, has not had good class consciousness and has not, and has come from a very sort of colonial kind of um, uh, very limited standpoint. And so when I, I, I got my start in um, working for an international coalition that was um, forwarding a global south perspective um, in the climate, in the global climate justice movement and especially in multilateral spaces like the UN. And so a lot that was about coordination with specifically um, social movements in the global south that were advancing a an internationalist um, anti-colonial vision of climate justice that was inherently rooted in um, in in toppling the billionaire class, in toppling this extreme wealth polarization and the long-lasting lingering effects of ongoing colonialism on so much of the world and the sort of uh, relegation of so much of the world to uh, the worst parts of the ongoing climate crisis. And um, just like really uh, climate justice as a place where um, not just global warming but issues of debt and development and economic justice all intersect. And when I came back to BC about 10 years ago to work in the environmental movement, I found that it was, it was a very, very limited space that I was entering. I was called an environmentalist for the first time. That was weird. Um, but also just recognizing that the, the struggles here were, were very much about just the environment. And so it's, it's been a journey, I mean, watching climate justice movements be informed deeply by, well, they're mostly, the, when, when we win, it's because we're indigenous led and because we are uh, operating from an anti-colonial uh, lens. But the rest of the time, we, are, uh, we have a lot to learn. And I think um, what we need to do now, you know, we've had a couple of years of undeniable climate impacts. All of, all of this is happening under this uh, framework of a warming world. Um, in the context of a warming world. And BC specifically has seen some really major climate impacts. Last year we had um, the heat dome event. I don't know how badly that affected Seattle as well. Um, did it, was it? Uh, yeah, not as bad as here, but yeah. Yeah. We did experience it. Yeah, it was probably like all in the same region. In BC we lost 700 people and that was, you know, a combination of deadly factors like you know, uh, people who people driven into poverty, mostly seniors who died in inadequate housing that didn't have appropriate uh, cooling measures. Um, there were there was very little access to public services for the for these folks who passed away. It was just a 
it was to sort of excuse my language a clusterfuck of of factors that led to those um, unfortunately preventable deaths, and so I think that really galvanized the climate movement into thinking about okay we need to do things differently and we need to find common cause and start working with you know. Uh, the anti-poverty movement and with labor, um, we haven't found those ways forward yet. And I think until we do find those ways forward, we are not going to actually be able to um, use power effectively at all. And so, sorry, that was a little bit of a, a windy route. But you know, in in my experience coming up against uh, the supposed progressivism of our progressive party, the BCNDP and the federal NDP, um, I have found that we are in a really, um, we're in a, we, I think this moment right now specifically, like coming right off the heels of Sarah Jama being elect, uh, ejected from the caucus and this, this extremely polarized moment around um, Israel and Palestine, I think all of this is really pointing to um, a real, Split in the in the progressive um, left in Canada, and uh, we don't really have a compass to get through this. I think there's a lot of folks who are politically homeless right now, and yeah. So I I, I just really appreciated hearing how you talked about using the party. Uh, using your office as a force to organize, not just along the lines of identity politics, because that has gotten our progressive party nowhere, um, but to organize in in a way that is um, it, well, like actually grassroots and actually um, real organizing. I think the NDP has really lost sight of what organizing actually means. And so, yeah, I have more questions than, than answers, really. So I'm going to pass it on. Thanks very much, and um, let's pass it over to, to Michael then. But I, I would just want to say one thing that I think is a really important point, that um, indigenous-led organizations have uh, been very successful, but there's also a, a deep division, as, as we know, right, between the, the band councils, which are a function of the Indian Act, and which are therefore colonial structures, which have largely gotten um, behind these uh, extractivist projects like Coastal Gas Link. Um, so there's, there's the band councils, but then there's also the, the traditional governance structures, which, was, which have really provided uh, massive resistance to, to these kinds of projects. And these are the, 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 the um, movements that we really need to get behind. Michael. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah th th thank you, um, Samir. Um, so, uh, Gashama, thank you so much for your, um, your talk. Uh, I was really... I was listening very closely, <laughs> and uh, I really liked it. I, I re especially liked what you said about building fighting movements. And I was also quite interested in, in, in your term working class. So really, I have a question about the working class and about how to build that fighting movement. But before I get there, I just want to, uh, to say one thing. The last time I was in this room, and I want to thank my partner, Davina, for reminding me. The last time I was in this room, uh, I think was when um, Stephen Salada was here, uh, speaking from um, uh, uh, about his Palestinian solidarity work. He wasn't speaking necessarily about that, but it was around the issue of him being unhired, for him being fired, if you recall, Samir. Uh, this was about 10 years ago in, in 2014, 2015. Yeah, you were here. Um, and um, he had been offered this job at Urbana-Champaign in Illinois, um, as a Palestinian uh, scholar, but then um, students and basically faculty organized, get him unhired because of his um, because of his because of his position. Really, it wasn't really because of a specific activism that he was involved in. It was just because of, in a sense, because of his because of his body. I think, right, because of who he was. Yeah. So I thought that that's maybe we can talk about that more. Um, because I think that does color almost everything that would come after this in the sense of the, co the, the current conflict in, um, in Palestine, Gaza, and, and Israel in general. Uh, so the reason I, I'm interested in, in this notion of building fighting movements is because for, for a very long time I've, I have been in uh, different organizations, especially in Toronto where I used to live, um, building, if you will, fighting movements in some respects. Um, and uh, 
what grew out of, I think, that experience of building fighting movements, uh, being allies with the uh, Ontario Coalition Against Poverty, being the co-chair of the Metro Network for Social Justice, the MNSJ was, for some of you might remember, was involved in the days of action when Harper, uh, Harper, um, uh, when Harris was the premier. And I think Samir also remembers those days in Ontario with horror. With horror. And so MNSJ was very involved in building those bridges between community and labor. So I was quite involved in that activity. And, and how was I involved in that activity? I was involved in that activity because I was sent as a delegate, right, representing the Chinese Canadian National Council, the Toronto chapter. Eventually, I became one of the co-chairs, and I was a co-chair for the MNSJ for, for over a decade, until it basically fell apart, basically. And we can talk more about that, but it really kind of fell apart, largely, I think, because of unions, or perhaps the business unions, no longer being interested in building those movements. And not least to which because a lot of people were quite involved with the anti-poverty movement. And so organizations like OCAP were doing things like occupying buildings, right? And unions didn't really want to be associated with that type of activity uh, for, for, for a number of reasons. Um, so so I, I guess, you know, I think, I'm just looking at my notes, there was so much community and union building, bridges building. I remember being quite involved with different representatives from the CAW, uh, from steel workers, from QP. Myself, I was also a QP worker for many, many years because I, I did my PhD at York University where I, where I met Samir you know, ages ago. Um, and so I was very involved in organizing so-called Unit 2 sessional contract workers, not, not unlike what you, you've been doing, I think. Um, and so, you know, I think there was a lot of it. My, my experience is, is very much involved with community, with labor, uh, with labor organizing, and then also trying to build the bridges between that and also, and it's interesting what you said about identity politics, because I do actually think organizing with the Chinese Canadian National Council was very useful, right? Because you can argue for resettlement services, you can argue for anti you can you can advocate on behalf of communities who can't speak, right? So you can speak on their behalf. So I think that there's, there's, there's a place for that. And so, sorry for this long rambling uh, question, but the question is, I'm, I'm wondering what, if you can, um, if you can tell us a little bit about what, what you mean by the working class, because Currently, w w the main thing that I've been doing now since I've relocated to uh, Vancouver in the past 10 years is uh, I'm working basically with uh, harm reduction and with drug users. And those, I would, those, that community or that demographic would really be understood to be outside the working class. Like they are so marginal, they are the untouchables, right? They, nobody wants to work with them in, the, in that sense, right? Because these are people who are unreliable who are who have an who have a, a very extreme uh, addiction, for example, um, to illicit substances, um, and yet are are grossly underserved uh, and and whose charter rights are being violated every day uh, uh, by municipal, provincial, and, and federal entities. So I think I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, what is the working class? It seems like my experience with organizing on the ground, and then also now being a faculty member at, at Kwantlen, I'm a member of business unionism, right? So I'm, I represent uh, my union, uh, the Kwantlen Faculty Association, at Labor Council, where Stephen, I see, I see you there. Uh, thank you for being a great uh, a leader and, 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 and convening great meetings. But at the same time, I'm not so sure if my membership, who I represent, has any interest in working class struggles or any type of interest in building a fighting movement. They are interested in wages and benefits. That's about it. And yes, we have arms of the, uh, I guess, the KFA that might be more interested in those things. But as many people in this room know, that's just a small group of people within a much larger uh, union collective, right? So I think there's the question of collect collectivity. There's the question of who speaks for who. There's the question of the underclass, who is the working class, 
And how do, we, how do we do that type of organizing? Because from my perspective, it seems very disparate. It's so disparate that I'm, I'm not so sure when, when, when you, Samir, when you said, oh, well, everybody is worried about like, like Gaza and about Palestinians. I'm not so sure if everyone in this room is on the same page. Yeah. Thanks very much, Michael. Those are some challenging uh, questions. And we might hear a little bit uh, from our next speaker, Yamina, about the um, degrees of, uh, of uh, um, union solidarity uh, on the picket lines of the strike that just happened. There were a lot of uh, SWUFA faculty members there, but then there were those who crossed. So there's a kind of fissure in, in, in our union, to be sure. So Yeah, please. Yeah, that was, that was a great point, and I kind of want to echo that, because one of the things that we struggle with within the university is um, trying to engage with faculty members, staff, and trying to like build working, soli working people's solidarity within the university when the, the definition of who the working class is is so tenuous here. Um, but I, I was, as I was listening to you speak about the weaponization of EDI, I was trying to just, I was just thinking about what happened during our strike, uh, because we had to engage with quite a lot of that, because we had people in places of power in this university who were talking about EDI, um, and at the same time going out and hiring um, private security who had been um, surveilling indigenous land defenders um, at Ferry Creek and uh, uh, protesters who were against the Trans Mountain Pipeline. And these same private security was then hired to surveil picketers at SFU, right? Um, and um, there were all of these excuses given about how, how these, these strikers are, I don't know, beating people up, I don't know. If, there are people from our union here. I don't know if any of us look like we can beat somebody up. Uh, <laughs> but um, so all of these reasons were given to sort of start surveilling people. And there's definitely a very genuine concern from community members, which, which helped actually um, faculty members, community members who, who sort of mobilized against that, who called on the university to um, uh, sort of fire these um, Pinkertons. And, um, one of the things that was extremely concerning about this is that this was a form of retaliation. There is a larger question about what happens to this, the data that they collect, what happens to the footage that they have, all the videos that they were taking of us at the picket line. But a larger question is that this surveillance was a form of retaliation by the university itself. They were um, in people's faces, taking pictures, hiding and pretending to be community members and asking picketers about uh, why we are on strike and things like these. And this was creating a sense of fear. So um, there is obviously a larger question about what happens to this data. There are members at our picket lines who are international students who come from countries where they're not allowed to participate in strikes and picket lines um, and protests. And all of this data is then in the hands of an organization that is known for feeding this data of protesters to the RCMP. And that is a question itself. But the other larger question is, what was the university thinking when they were, when they called these Pinkertons to surveil their own workers? And how does that impact the, the working class solidarity and the, the sort of empathy that we have within the university itself, the connections that we have to the admin, the fact that we have to now go back to work and look these people in the faces who hired these Pinkertons to surveil us. Um, and that's sort of a question that I was coming to, which is how do you how do you go how do you work towards working class solidarity when there are these tenuous relations between people who should be on the side of the, the strikers or the picketers, right? Because at the end of the day, the admin are are the admin, but they're also very often faculty members. They are people who who teach alongside us. They are our colleagues who were crossing picket lines and were. Um, part, like part and parcel in the surveillance, and I know this is a very difficult question, but how do you work towards working class solidarity when these divisions continue to arise? Thanks very much, Yamina. Now I think I'll just turn it over to Shama. You. Sure. Uh, thank you all for everything you said. It's. Uh, I, I think the learning goes both ways because it's very important for me to hear about what's been happening here. And I don't know if I'll miss some, some of the points that have been raised, but just uh, the first thing you talked about, surveillance. Um, for, just to be clear, this surveillance, it's completely scandalous that the university did this. It needs to be exposed. So I think 
sorry, uh, it, ne it needs to be exposed. So I think at the very least, there needs to, <laughs> there need to be some op-eds written to talk about how shameful this is that a place of learning, that the administration at a place of learning did this. And also to call it for what it is, I think publicly we have to say this was uh, um, plain and simple union busting. This was a union busting tactic. And you're totally right, you mean it, that they, who knows what, where they will use this data and, and you can only imagine the, uh, the nefarious degrees that they would be willing to go to, you know, with the RCMP and everything. But, at, but the most immediate reason why they did that, obviously, was to uh, intimidate those of you who were on strike. And I think that's why, the, that's why it's very important for us. Uh, I mean, part of class struggle unionism, as opposed to business unionism, is uh, understanding that our solidarity goes well beyond just the members of our union, local, and so the faculty union uh, members who didn't cross the picket line and who stood with you, that's super crucial as well. But as far as your question of, um, I mean, just to be clear, just so I'm understanding, the people who had the authority to call these uh, Pinkertons, they're not the faculty, right? That's the administration, just to yeah. understand. But there were faculty members who crossed the picket line when you were on strike. I think that's a, yeah, that's a very important question. And I don't know that there's any, um, there, there's probably no one answer to that. But I think just a, in a general sense to understand how to deal with this, it has to be that we are, I mean, our starting point has to be to try and have a conversation with those who are crossing the picket line to explain to them that if you cross the picket line now, and undermine our strike and prevent us from winning our demands, they're going to come after you in the next contract cycle. I mean, you know, your contract is going to be up for renewal at some point. It's being negotiated okay. right now. Exactly. <laughs> so I think, so I think explaining, yeah, I mean, that's even closer than I thought it was. I thought it was going to be a year or two from now. Uh, so I think uh, we, those of us who are on strike, you know, and this is part of the political strategy for the strike, going on strike, and I'm not, and I don't mean to. Um, say you guys didn't do, do it, I'm, I'm not coming from that standpoint, but just sharing what, what I think should be done in general. I think uh, a big part, and this goes to your questions as well, as to how do, we, how do we really organize, and if our own members are not really excited about or getting organized in some way, then where do you go from there? I think uh, political education inside the labor movement used to be a thing at one time, I mean, not in my lifetime, I mean, I'm talking about reading history. And that was important. And I think we, we, those of us who are here and who are in labor unions, we need to seek opportunities to carry out that political education. And concretely, I mean, I'll give you an example. One of our members in Socialist Alternative in, in Seattle is a member of the Iron Workers Local. The, it's not just business unionists. I mean, these are straight up reactionary leaders, some of them you know, they voted for Trump. I mean, they're, they're really horrible. They're, the, they're almost like they will call the cops on their own members. That's how bad the leadership is. In that union, our member, who, because he's a socialist, he understands what he sh how she, he should approach it. He started um, sort of inviting some of his uh, co-workers, you know, fellow members, to just come after work, after their construction, you know, shift is done, to just come and talk for an hour about uh, you know, how the Teamster General Strike w won its victories in 1934, you know, so, so that's just one example, because there are very important lessons. So one of the concrete lessons could be for, uh, for you all to discuss, what, what, should, what are the points we should say when a fellow worker from the labor movement, from maybe from another union, is crossing the picket line? I think that needs to be discussed, and then see how it goes. I mean, it, it really depends on the concrete situation. Uh, I don't think... Uh, condemning them straight away as cabs w would work necessarily, although there is a time and place to do that as well. But I don't, I wouldn't say start that with step number one. Step number one is to try to convince them politically that it's not in their interest to go it. So in, in other words, uh, I think one of the one of the hallmarks. This is and this is why socialists and Marxists like us really put our emphasis on the working class. It's not some fetishism. It's it's a scientific understanding. That at the end of the day, there are lots of things in society, in this world, that are pulling all of us apart. 
And the ruling class wants that. They want us to be atomized and isolated at whatever level. You know, and there's an um, you know, in, infinite number of factors on, on the basis of which we might be divided. So the fact that we have our interests together in terms of what we can win in the workplace, that is the one thing that joins us together. And so I think that is, that is what we rely on. And so when we talk to people who are crossing the picket line, I think we have to make an argument of their self-interest, that their, their interest is bound up with ours, not with the bosses. If they do the bosses bidding, the bosses are going to come after them as well. Um, and then again, yeah, and we're, we're happy to have longer conversations on that, uh, on, on specific situations. But in terms of the other questions that came up, I mean, you know, just clarifying what we mean by identity politics, it doesn't, uh, when, when we talk about the dangers of identity politics, we are not saying, and this is a very important distinction, we're not saying that we should not be fighting on issues that affect specific populations. Obviously, the Indigenous Peoples Day is a prime example of that. Uh, and also the the fight that we uh, did around the weapons ban that was that was for everybody, but it was primarily uh, uh, oriented around the black community. We have fought alongside v the Vietnamese community, the Somali and East African communities on their issues uh, related to their religious persecution against them, but also renters' rights for East Africans and so on. So I think we absolutely should take every opportunity that we can, and this is actually important for the labor movement, to lead as the labor movement on these uh, issues that may affect specific communities. When I say, when I talk about the dangers of identity politics, I'm talking about the way we approach these issues. You know, if we, if we at all times are understanding that the way you fight for all people, including the oppressed, is by understanding that we have to build principle solidarity and not allow the identity itself or the identity argument to be weaponized against the good of all of us. That's what we mean by identity politics, not fighting on those issues. And as far as you know, what we mean by the working class, I mean, obviously, uh, as, as we all know, we're talking about working people in general. And that could mean a barista at Starbucks. It could mean. Uh, obviously, university professors and uh, TAs, and uh, you know, like many here, um, it could mean a tech worker, and uh, it's a question of. I mean, all of these are technically working people, but when we say the working class, we're maybe not necessarily immediately talking about tech workers, but I will come to that in a second. Uh, but it is people who have to work for a living, and hence. It does matter to them what, how their bosses are, explo are exploiting them. But the degrees of the exploitation might be different. And also, when we say working people or working class as a whole, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a shorthand. But again, specific situations will elicit uh, specific responses from us. Uh, what I mean by that is the opportunities to advance working class based struggle and win victories are not the same everywhere. You know, for example, the auto workers have been on strike in the US, and they have won a, a real measure of victories uh, through their strike action. We are not going to see that kind of strike action among tech workers. I'm just making a comparison to explain. Uh, and so you won't catch us you know, routinely talking about tech workers. But technically, yeah, they are part of the working class as well. But it's also, our job is also a question of strategy. We're not just here to make abstract points you know, just for our intellectual satisfaction. It's a question of how do we use the most strategic and immediate opportunities to advance struggle everywhere we see them. And so wherever any section of the working class is moving into struggle and fighting back, there it's our, it, that our job is to then advance that at that moment. And whatever that is, it, it's our job. So that's why we, we cannot afford to have a parochial attitude about which section, it's, it's whichever section is moving into struggle at that moment. And we can't rule anything out. I mean, uh, people remember during the Me Too movement, there was a rolling walkout by Google tech workers from Seattle all the way to my home city, Mumbai, against sexual harassment policies in the company. And they won some victories. They didn't win all, everything that they were fighting for. But these workers are well-paid workers, you know, six-figure salary workers. They don't, probably don't have an identity as workers. They probably think of themselves as professionals and they don't have a union. 
but they still took action, and that's important. And in, even in terms of climate, Amazon tech workers mm -hmm. have been, you know. Yeah. So I think, yeah, all of that, all of that matters. But in terms of, you asked a very important question about, you know, so when we say working class, sh should we not then be fighting on issues that affect people who are facing serious problems of drug addiction or, or homelessness? You know, they are, they're not technically working class because they're not, maybe they may not be working people, although they're, there's a, now a thing of working homeless. You know, working people are homeless. That's how bad the housing crisis is. But setting that aside for a second, just to explain, I think we, again, it, it go, comes back to where we think struggle can be advanced and victories can be won um, at a given moment. And so if we are focused on auto, the auto worker strike at a given moment, that doesn't mean we don't care about the homeless issues, but we also don't believe that we can let go of opportunities wherever they are. So, because what, because the, re, the simple reason is that wherever we win victories, it will actually have ripple effects for everything else. So I'll just give one concrete victory and I mean a concrete example and stop there, which is that in the tax Amazon movement, if you look at what we actually won, you know, as I said, $214 million every year for affordable housing and homeless and other social services, the beneficiaries of much of that are not going to be what you would call the working class. It's going to be the much more low income and poor people, the more vulnerable people. But the people who were on the forefront of fighting for it were absolutely union members and socialists who understood that even if I am personally not going to benefit from this, winning this is super crucial because then it helps us push back against Jeff Bezos and the big corporations and our union fight is right absolutely against them. And, and the reason I'm mentioning that is because the Tax Amazon victory ended up inspiring, in part, obviously it was, it was a small thing in a small city, but it end, ended up helping to inspire other struggles. And then right now, I should mention, in Kentucky, at, at the um, Amazon, uh, Amazon Air Hub at the K Kentucky Cincinnati Airport, Northern Kentucky Airport, the most important unionizing drive is happening right now in the US. And they, these are workers, these are classic working class people, warehouse workers. They're up against a huge, you know, it's, it's up against the behemoth of union busting. But in part, they were inspired by what we were able to win for poor and homeless people in Seattle. Thanks very much, Shama. Um, just a couple of points, and I'd like to open it up, and we'll send a microphone around. Um, uh, people will uh, come with questions, but just a, a couple of points. I, I, I just wanted to add, um, Mina, to the to your wonderful presentation that there was an additional threat, right? Um, and that was a threat to discontinue uh, healthcare coverage um, for members of the union. And this is. Uh, Quite unbelievable, especially in this still, uh, you know, ongoing uh, COVID crisis. Um, and I think that the last point, and it ties into what what I mentioned in what you said, is sort of what I highlighted in what I thought was particularly valuable in in, in your talk, um, and that was the importance of. Um, consciousness and the importance of political education, which you just came back to, uh, and that answers in a way this question of working class identity, because of course there's a there's a working class in itself. Right? Those are objectively members of the working class, and there's a working class for itself. Those who identify as workers, and I think one of the challenges uh, it would seem to me um, for progressives and for the labor movement um, in general is really to move from the, the, the class in itself to the class for itself. That would be the, the task of political education. And I think that might be a role that, that the Institute uh, uh, can take up ever more and, and uh, open up uh, our, uh, um, our halls to, uh, to labor in, in a way that uh, um, uh, is so necessary today. So I would just like to uh, open it up for discussion. Romana, come here. Okay. Thank you for uh, all your great speeches, and Shama, uh, thank you for your great talk. Um, I really like the point about political analysis you made and trying to explain why, uh, the why the police union is not part of the labor movement and sort of trying to distinguish between that. Uh, but <clears throat> I heard you sort of talk about different uh, entities in Seattle and elsewhere, and one entity which I sort of found missing is the military and the military industrial complex, which is also a big part of Seattle, as you quite well know. And of course, you know, if the police is a arm for class warfare, 
the military is an arm for US imperialism. Uh, and so I wanted you to reflect on how one can take on them, because that is actually, you know, when Eisenhower first talked about it in the 1950s, you know, it was a very small entity, if you like, even though if it's, it was a powerful entity. But now it's sort of spread everywhere, right, including into Canada, right? And so trying to organize against them is a much harder task. And so I'm curious to hear what you have to say. Thanks. There you go. Um, yeah, that's very important. And actually, you know, uh, incidentally, the the reason I didn't mention, and, and of course it is very relevant though, is that Boeing, which is one of the things I assume you're talking about, uh, very, sorry? Raytheon. Yeah, Raytheon, of course. Uh, but it, in the Seattle vicinity, obviously, Boeing. And um, the reason uh, is that, uh, one reason is that, one reason we, we weren't able to uh, sort of, you know, maybe choose a strategic fight against Boeing, although we did, we did some activism in relation to them, if I have time I can mention that, is that, uh, you know, before our time in Seattle, the Boeing Corporation, and this is something that I've heard anecdotally, I've not verified this, so you know, I, 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 don't, I can't tell you, I can vouch for its uh, truthfulness, but it sounds truthful to me. Uh, which is that Boeing used to be technically within the city of Seattle, uh, you know, like municipality. And uh, they, I think, what I've heard is that they found that it's easier for them if they carve out their own municipality that does not involve the Seattle electorate, you know, because as I said, the people in Seattle, ordinary people, are very progressive. It's not reflected in the city council, but uh, anyway. so. In that sense, Boeing has its own municipal. In the, it's, it, it does not. It comes under SeaTac. It does not come under the Seattle jurisdiction. So, in that sense, it has been limited what we've been able to do to fight against them. One of the things that we have raised, uh, one of the demands we have raised right now, actually, we had a we held a press conference from my office um, a week and a half ago, um, de demanding that the U.S. Congress end military funding for the Israeli state. And part of that is Boeing is sending, um, I can't remember exactly what they are, like some sort of bomb, like some sort of, you know, basically munitions that are going to create dis destruction. Uh, and uh, I think it's a very important demand, especially at this given moment, as, as you were saying, Anjali, this is a pivotal moment. So I think a political demand for the protests that are going on right now internationally, there are massive protests actually. I would say they are more than a lot of people expected. And if you look at the opinion polls in, C uh, in the US, actually, uh, it's still more towards Israel, but this is the US, right? I mean, you, you, it sh that should not be a surprise to you. What is interesting is that if you look at the polls for young people, it is far less pro-Israel than you would expect. And we should also expect that, that those polls are gonna shift the more that there is bloodshed in Gaza. So more, the more, I mean, we don't want the ground invasion offensive to go any further, but it's expected to go further and we expect that protests will build up. So we think that those protests should actually build up into a systematic anti-war movement. And one of the demands of the anti-war movement should be to urge our siblings in the labor movement to refuse to move arm shipments. And that's diff, but I just want to clarify, I just want to clarify that's not the same as what is commonly known as BDS. BDS, you know, boycott, divestment, and sanction. It talks about all goods and services. We don't, we don't, we don't think that that's a good strategy in general. I mean, although we support people, you know, who bring that forward in in the sense that they are also anti-war. So in that sense, we are aligned with them. But we don't directly support BDS because uh, we don't think that it's useful to create sort of a division among working people on just general goods and services. But on military and ammunition, in military goods and ammunition, absolutely that's a matter of principle. And I think that is something that we can win real unity around if we have some organizing around it. And Raytheon, of course, is a big uh, thing. One thing I'll mention is uh, there was a, one of the you know conversations among these corporate types of Raytheon was some some, Someone exposed it. Someone was there posing as somebody in, in that shareholder's room, I think. And there's an audio of it from just two days ago. And these, these guys, they are talking about 
how much profits they're going to make in such a clinical fashion. Oh, we're going to we're going to ship this and that and the other, and everything that they're talking about is a killing machine. It's Oh, it's unspeakable. And so I think well, there are a lot of workers who would want to fight along, along these lines. And I'm not saying that it's going to happen today. It's going to be very hard. But I'm saying that that's a demand we should raise to see how people respond and say, you know, longshore workers, railroad workers, um, the engineers and the machinists in Boeing and Raytheon and others, you know, should really take this up. Yeah, it's uh, Paul Hull in Vancouver. And uh, my question is around municipal election campaigns and getting unity on the left in municipal election campaigns. Because what we had in 2022 in the October uh, municipal election, we had Ken Sim who went out well in advance and raised huge money, big money from developers and big businesses in the city. And then we had Disunity it appeared on the on the left and parties, municipal parties that the electorate perceived as progressive parties. Maybe they weren't all progressive, but the, the public is confused. And there's 125 names on the Vancouver ballot. So you have 10, 15 people running for mayor, and you know 40 people running for 10 positions on city council. So. Heading into 2026, and the result, of course, is workers lose. We get rid of the living wage policy at the city. It's going to be a developer's paradise in the city for the next three years. So what can you do, and specifically maybe the Seattle uh, example, to get unity on the left and to bring working people together and to get municipal parties so that they're not running against each other and competing against each other with the result that big business wins the election? Um, I can answer that question, but there are actually others from, is, is, if it's okay, from Socialist Alternative Canada, who, because they were very involved in, I mean, we were too from Seattle, but um, I think they are, uh, they were much involved in much more close quarters, and I can, of course, also respond in addition to them, but they were involved in, they've been involved in COPE work and also with the Gene Swanson campaign, so if Well, I'll just say I know one of the big differences is you have the Democrats and we have Socialist Alternative. You don't have a plethora of different parties on the left in C Seattle running for electoral politics. But we uh, do think that we need a progressive, you know, election electorate and a party. And um, unfortunately, all these splits in the parties where one party splits off and goes a bit further to the center and is uh, in some ways a betrayal of the working class. And it's led us to the position that we're in now in Vancouver, I would say. But uh, how do you prevent that? Um, is that we need to really build a strong working class on the basis of class solidarity and a very strong program. So, and get that support. Uh, I would just chime in, you, you asked, basically your question is what is to be done. I remember when in Toronto with the Metro Network for Social Justice, every municipal election, we put together a newspaper that was written by a community in labor called The Badger. It was published every four years, every, well, whenever they there was a municipal election, and we would rank all the candidates. Yeah. So, I mean, we probably are not able to publish physical newspapers today. That was 20 years ago. But maybe something could be done uh, similar. I mean, I know different organizations do that type of ranking, but maybe there could be something that would be organized through Labor Council. Chung's just going to comment and then Shiraz. I think, yeah, just to add to what uh, comments have already been made, I think um, obviously, I mean, obviously you're, you're right. If, if you have so many disparate organizations running candidates and there's confusion and people don't even know, then the right wing ends up winning. And that's how ABC basically had a route, right, in the last election. It's terrible. Uh, and we were here, we were here campaigning for the COPE candidates. Um, 
I think obviously, yeah, we should we should use whatever mechanism as as you mentioned in terms of clarifying things to people. But I think the problem is a little bit deeper in the sense that rather than uh, talking, I mean, rather than having unity in in among those organizations as the starting point, I would have the starting point as what is the strategy we need to win the uh, you know win. To, or, to get the working class people together to, to defeat the right wing parties and actually win seats for the left. And I don't think that, especially where, where the organizations were at that time, I don't think that simply talking about unity among them would have got, first of all, I don't think that, would have, that was going to work because there wasn't unity among them. But more importantly, there wasn't, unfortunately for us, in, and this includes this critique includes the COPE candidates as well and the COPE strategy as well, said I don't think there was one single organization among them, on the left I mean, which had anything like the strategy that Socialist Alternative had been recommending. And I'm, and I'm speaking this from, uh, saying this from personal knowledge of uh, Socialist Alternative members who have been involved in discussions in COPE urging that we bring about a fighting strategy for our campaigns, you know, for the campaigns that we are running. And I think, Part of, um, unfortunately, Jean Swanson not winning was, you know, it's not, it's not on her in the sense that she was obviously extremely popular. People, you know, a lot of working people knew that she was genuine. You know, she was like the opposite of a corrupt politician, you know. But at the end of the day, the strategy of the campaign matters. And if you don't have a strategy that can win, then you're not going to win no matter how decent of a human being your candidate is. And I think that's part of the problem. I think I don't think any of the organizations that were represented in on the ballot on those many, many seats, I mean, sorry, many, many, um, whatever, um, positions uh, had um, embodied that kind of strategy. And so I think uh, we, we may not be, we may not be able to have that happen or be accomplished at the municipal level in Vancouver. I mean, I'm just being honest. I don't know if that's going to work out in the next election. It may, it may not. I don't know if their organizations are there or have they taken on board the lessons of what, why the ABC won all these uh, seats in the last election. Has, the, has such a meeting even happened? Has there been an organizing meeting of the left to uh, discuss the lessons of why we lost and how can we win. I mean, in the absence of all of the, any of that, I don't think we can expect to win. But what I will say is that, that we have to look, again, this is sort of a repetition of what I was saying earlier, but I think the responsibility of the left is to look for opportunities wherever they arise. And it may not be Vancouver municipal elections. It may or may not be. But if it's not, fine. We'll move, we'll move on to other things. In other words, if there are massive protests, if there's potential for a real anti-war movement against Israel in Vancouver, then that's where we should put our energies. Uh, and, but at the end of the day, no matter which avenue we are moving forward on or which sector of society there is struggle emerging, Ultimately, it does come down to some fundamentals, and that goes back to something that Anjali was mentioning earlier, which is that there are many people, as you were saying, who feel politically homeless from the NDP because they don't see the NDP establishment as sharing what they think needs to happen. And we're, we're seeing, I mean, what happened with you and also with Sarah Jama, is, am I saying the name right? I mean, that, that's just very blatant. and so. Uh, and you, you uh, I, I was even uh, struck by the fact that you said that it's a little bit of a split-like situation. I think everything that you were saying, Anjali, it, that points towards a need for a new party for the working class. It, the NDP is not working, and we need that to happen. And so rather than um, sort of worrying about this one specific municipal election or not, as I, I'm not minimizing the importance of it. I'm just saying that may not be the starting point. Starting point could be something else. Ultimately, though, the fundamental point that we have to bring up is the need for a new party, and that has that discussion has to start somewhere. Thank you for sharing your justice-friendly, justice-friendly experiences. My question is about the role of the retired working class of workers and also elders and grandparents and so on. Because I'm 75, I, I've been a teacher all my life. And also, I see that there is, there is a ignoring attitude of 
once you are 65, wait for COVID, you, then you'll die. So I was wondering, uh, in Seattle especially, what role does elderly people play in supporting you or the alternative, socialist alternative? Because now, even in the, in the war, uh, uh, in, the, in, in the struggle for justice for Palestinians, there are a lot of elderly people who are coming out and marching in support of the ceasefire and so on. But uh, do they have to wait for Netanyahu to play a role, or do they do it now? And second was just that a lot of environment movement have been uh, their justice and issues were appropriated and now run by a lot of warlords, like our feminist president, prime minister. He's now championing environmental issues. So, so it seems like there is a problem of, of appropriation. OK. So but I, let's leave the second one. But let's comment on the support of elders. Thank you. Well, no, I, I would love for you to speak to, I mean, I think the, specifically the question about elders. I would love to add to your question about appropriation. So maybe the elders thing first and then I think. Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, first of all, just to concretely, I uh, appreciate you asking these questions. Uh, concretely, we want to build fighting movements. And our goal, if you want to be successful, should be always, I mean, those of us who are helping to lead it. And, I, and again, you know, just to, step away from the question for a second just to talk about this, is that we shouldn't be shy of um, providing leadership when we have the ability to do so. And also, un we shouldn't aim to have leaderless movements. I mean, such a thing doesn't exist. There's always leadership, whether it's accountable or sh in the shadows, those are the different questions. There's always leadership. In other words, it's not, it's not, even, it's not even necessarily it, it, that it's always nefarious. I mean, there's leadership of ideas. You can have the leadership of winning ideas, or you can have leadership of ideas like you had in the Vancouver elections where it didn't work, and the right wing ended up taking advantage of it. So in, uh, at the end of the day, we do, we should, we should not believe in this spontaneous whatever. It doesn't work. That's not how it works. There are some ideas, whether they're good or bad ideas is the only difference. And so uh, in that sense, we, we, those of us who are leading movements, whether it's labor or social movements, our goal should be to minimize barriers for people to play a ro healthy role. And what I mean is, when I, what I mean by healthy is not like physical health. I mean politically um, a good role that is in service of the the, our larger causes in, and not something that they're using it for their own careerist interests and whatever. So in that sense, we should, want, we should aim to uh, make it clear that it doesn't matter what your age is. If you want to fight alongside us, you, you are part of this. And in fact, uh, that's been true concretely in Seattle in the fights that we have had. I mean, one, uh, as soon as you started speaking, actually, the woman who came to my mind is this a uh, woman, her name was Imogene Williams. She unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago. She was just, she put young people to shame in not only her energy, and I'm, you know, I'm not being patronizing, she, she was actually energetic, but I mean in her political clarity. At all those moments when socialist alternative was being attacked for, you know, by all these gatekeepers that I mentioned, she was one of those people who, were, who was crystal clear in her mind about why it is important. She fought for us, you know, in among in, in, in formal conversations, fought for our ideas. Uh, she was 80 years old, and so um, there is undoubtedly a space and need for people, no matter what your age is, retirees to fight for us. Another, uh, alongside us, another woman who comes to mind is Barbara Finney. She is a very active. She's very active in all these movements. She's a retired uh, federal government worker, you know, retired union member. Um, so you know, you see countless examples. Obviously, uh, there is we, we we do place emphasis on young people only because we do see young people's consciousness much more uh, sort of you know open to fight back, especially in this day and age. Gen Z, you know, they have nothing to lose. I mean, look at the 
crap world they've inherited, you know, for the most part, unless they are the children of very well-off yeah. parents, you know, what, what do you have to lose? I mean, you, you, the willingness to fight is very high. So in that sense, we do orient to young people, so we're, and we're, not, we're not hiding that. But at the same time, we want to be welcome. And so there are actually uh, older members of Socialist Alternative, and many of us are getting old, you know, and we're not going to be young forever. Um, so all that is true. But though I think your question uh, you, uh, may have been specifically about age, but I think it also brings up other questions which also sort of um, come up in, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a thought in my mind from other questions as well, is that the, what we need for our movements is to have uh, accountable structures. And when I say structures, I mean leadership positions or whatever. And they're not positions as in paid positions or anything like that. But just to give you a concrete example, in the Tax Amazon movement, the reason we were able to ultimately prevail against what we call the black misleaders who were trying to undermine it was because when we launched the Tax Amazon movement, we, uh, we, you know, we had thousands of people in the, the, the inauguration of the movement. And we, from that, we launched, we, we called for a Tax Amazon, the first Tax Amazon action conference where we had you know, 600, 700 people there. And you know, these are all just rank and file people, just ordinary people who want to win something. And then in the, you know, in, in the, in, with, with full transparency in front of them, we elected what we call the Tax Amazon Coordinating Committee. And these were people, and I, and I was on the Tax Amazon Coordinating Committee, I was one of the co two co-chairs of the committee. But we did that in such a way that we made it very clear to the rank and file of the movement that we are accountable to you and we are going to make every important decision collectively. There's going to be discussion, debate, and voting on everything. And the coordinating committee's responsibility is to carry out the decisions of the conference as a whole. This is, it's not going to look exactly like that carbon copy everywhere, but it's a model of what we need in social movements. Because if we don't do that, then you'll have leaders. They just won't be accountable. And then many of them will end up selling out. Well, I just had a, I, if I can, and, uh, add to this gentleman's question about this. Can you reiterate the question? Yes, I think you were asking about um, the co-optation of some of our demands. And I think this is something that I uh, wanted to and failed to speak to in the beginning, which is that the, the two times that I ran for office were really interesting um, experiments and almost like vindication, like there were vindications of something that us on the left have known instinctively, which is that when you actually speak unapologetically to um, a genuinely anti-capitalist vision for the economy and for um, you know what, what uh, us in the climate movement call a just transition, for a, a genuine economy of care and redistribution, there was just this like incredible visceral response that got out of my control, out of our team's control, both times. I, and I, I don't think it was a coincidence. You know, both times I went into these races just ex speaking explicitly to a politics of redistribution and of, um, and of, it was just that, like both, you know, in the first time I ran, it was uh, an unwinnable riding, and then suddenly the uh, suddenly we came within 400 votes of, win of winning, and then in the leadership race that I ran in last year, um, that was also, um, you know, a sort of like principled entry into the race. The idea was to move the entire field of candidates left, but instead we ended up having this uh, uh, snowball effect of this sort of decentralized, um, it got way out of our control, you know, to the, to the point where we had to get kicked out of the race. Uh, but it was just, it was just, it became too much of a threat. yeah, yeah, because we, we sold so many memberships, but we weren't, we weren't able to track those in any way because it was happening in such a decentralized way. Um, people were spreading it among their networks. I mean, we were having like taxi drivers, you know, talk to people and, it was just a really interesting visceral response. Anyway, so what I wanted to ask you about that is that there's that thing about political clarity, but 
we don't have a, so for me that was a vindication. There's this energy there, there's this desire there, but we don't have containers for people to put that energy into, um, like organizing vehicles that are easily um, accessible, that are absorbent, we say. Um, and instead, we have a progressive party that uses the terms, you know, has really learned to use the language of social justice. And it's creating this really, really confusing moment for people. There is a split. I mean, I, I think there is a lot of energy for a new party. It's not something that I'm working on, but you know, it's definitely there. Anyway, I just wanted you to speak to how do we actually provide those containers for people to move this political uh, energy and activation that they're experiencing um, forward into, a, into an actual movement? And how can we as organizers provide that and create that? And um, yeah, I think that's, uh, there's so many parts to this question. But yeah, I think that's, that's one of the biggest challenges that we've experienced over this past year is we've had this moment of real political activation and then we didn't have the right channels to move people into after that. Um, how, um, I, one thing I'm confused about is how, how does that relate to the co-optation question? Yeah, it's kind of two That's things. <laughs> it's kind of two it's things. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, well, because the only place that people can move to is like, you know, the progressive, the so-called progressive party, uh -huh. but yeah, it's, yeah. it's kind of the smoke and mirrors dance of like, they use the language of social justice really well, but explicitly are not advocating right. for our interests. And so, I mean, people, you spoke to political education as like a really key way to help people differentiate when they are being li you know, lied to. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, how to basically, how to be more porous as organizers, how to be more absorbent, how to create avenues for people to come in more easily. Right, so first of all, just on your uh, original point about you know, that, that the NDP establishment, and we say this about the Democratic Party in the United States, is that it's the graveyard of social movements. Yeah. And you know they they are they are the co-optors in chief because yeah. and and that's what co-optation means. It's not that co-optation doesn't mean obviously just to clarify that uh, if if you are not indigenous, you cannot fight in solidarity with uh, on indigenous related demands. And if you do that, then you're co-opting. That's not that's sometimes understood as co-optation, but that's not what co-optation co means. Uh, a force that's actually not intending to, as you said intending to fight on those things, actually is on the opposite side, but it's trying to take away all that energy and then dissipate it. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think uh, the way you've described the NDP establishment, that is how the Democratic Party is. And so that's not an avenue. So obviously, one thing is clear, that's not an avenue. Yeah. So yeah. What, what else is the question? And I think, I think uh, honestly, uh, as, as distant as it may sound, or abstract as it may sound, really it is raising everything that you are saying, it raises the question of the new, new party. So in other words, what I would say is that everything that you're saying actually points to me how immediate it is, the need for this new party. And obviously, again, it's not gonna happen tonight with this, these few people here, but it raises concrete questions. How do we get that done, right? So in other words, just to, again, hypothetically say it, when you were running for the party leadership and you found, you said, you know, there was this visceral response. There was all these people who wanted to fight and, uh, you know, people who are angry and, and frustrated and chafing at the, at the compromised nature of the NDP establishment. I think when we do something like that, and this is why also I think uh, having an organization of some form that has uh, principle clarity about strategy matters is that going in, imagine if you had run, but instead of the way you did it, you, you had run with some sort of organizing around you where you already had mapped out some steps uh, ahead of time, where all these thousands, tens of thousands of people, I'm assuming, who want to fight. Maybe you wouldn't win that position, but maybe you would, I don't know. I mean, to, when we ran in 2013, we had no conception that we were going to win when we launched the campaign. I mean, eventually, towards the end of the campaign, we could tell that we were going to win, and then we 
really pushed hard and you know won with a very slim margin. But, and honestly, one of the reasons I ended up agreeing, just as a personal note, is because I didn't, I was very reluctant. I mean, it was a democratic decision of the organization, so you have to accept that. But I also was very reluctant, and it was a sort of a joke at that time, you know, in early 2013 uh, or late 2012 when we decided to run. Don't worry, we're not going to win anyway, so it's just a campaign, <laughs> you know. Uh, and so here we are 10 years later. So you never know, you might win actually because of the momentum. But the reason we won was not just because there was momentum behind us, which there was, but the reason there was momentum behind us was because we had a strategy to begin with. You know, when we launched the campaign, our demands were what galvanized people. $15 an hour, taxing the rich, rent control, saying that uh, you know I'm a working class candidate, I'm gonna take an average worker's wage. I mean, you have no idea how much impact just pledging that I will take an average worker's wage had an impact. And of course we carried out that pledge, but people had never heard of it. I mean, I remember one woman who looked straight at me, I was at a, at a campaign table, and I thought she was going to be sort of, you know, very unhappy with me, and she didn't agree. She said, are you for real? Like, is this campaign for real? Could such a thing be actual? Could there be a campaign that was actually fighting for ordinary people like me? That was the reaction. But the reason we were able to galvanize them and you know, not let that energy be dissipated was because we had a concrete plan in mind that whether we won the election or not, we are going to launch some fight around the $15 minimum wage next year. That was the plan. And so I think having an idea of what those two or three concrete demands are going to be going in before you launch something, that's very important. Having an idea of who are going to be some of the key leaders who will carry this plan forward, uh, organize them, and it comes down to the nitty gritty of organizing, you know, having leaflets at every meeting, having a meeting announced so that at every event you go to, you know people can be directed to the next event. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a recursive thing. Um, and having discussions with them. And, and you know, I would also say for us as socialist alternative, I mean, this is not gonna apply to situations where you don't have an organization, but many people ended up joining socialist alternative itself. You know, they may not have done that initially, but they saw us in action, they saw our ideas in action, and they decided to join socialist alternative. Many of them joined because they saw what we were doing uh, in City Hall. You know, so that's also something. Thanks very much. And uh, Imina, uh, before I hand the microphone over to Imina, I will um, just say that we have time for, let's say, another round of questions. We've got Harinder, Jay, and then we can maybe take a third question, Robert. And then we will um, have a last sort of closing uh, thoughts from our panel. And then there's food in the back, and we can speak more, uh, uh, more informally. But first to you. Um, yeah, I've, I've been here listening and I really appreciate what you've been saying about, you know, working towards a new party and the reflections on the, the current progressive party in, in the province. And it sort of got me thinking about how uh, one of the things that we were personally like struggling against um, was, and I know that SPUFA, for example, has had very similar battles within the university itself, which is the, something called the PSEC mandate, which is the Public Sector Employers Council, which was created by, uh, unfortunately, the NDP in 1992, which essentially puts a cap on the wage increases that we can ask for every time uh, public sector employees go on a strike or are in bargaining. And um, one of the biggest issues with countering the BSEC is, like I said, it's a cap. So it almost sets a maximum on what unions can ask for. Um, what we did when we were on strike, and we have some uh, amazing members in the bargaining team here as well. What what we tried to do was try to find creative solutions around that BSEC, which was saying, oh, like this is what we sh think should be costed out of the mandate. This is something that we don't think should be costed out. But at the end of the day, we kind of had to like bow down to it because it was a larger provincial sort of mandate that was governing what we could bargain for. Um, and at the end of the day, we sort of just within ourselves talking about how what would really result in a essentially like a dismissal of the mandate or like the mandate finally like going away is a general strike. Something where members of um, independent unions like mine but also larger unions in BC sort of come together um, and as a show of solidarity sort of fight against the mandate and the, the party that put it in place. Um, but as and like echoing Michael's point initially is that 
a lot of unions, it's a fact, are business unions. So getting them to convince, like convincing them to like join forces together for something like a general strike is extremely difficult. And building a new party is definitely one of the solutions, but like w when you're working within the trade union space, how do you try to like encounter those like barriers against such a solidarity? Yeah, I think that's a very important question. And um, I think there are, there are steps that we can and should take, like concrete steps um, that point towards the, and, 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 and make it more clear to people uh, why we need an actual political party for the working class. And I'll give you a concrete example of what we have done in the US. I mean, we, we, this, is, this is election year in Seattle. We decided not to run for uh, the city council again because you know, we've been there now for 10 years. And we want to really uh, share these ideas with, uh, with, you know, with the national platform, not just limited to issues in Seattle. And so rather than run for re-election, what we have done, we meaning Socialist Alternative and I, we launched a national organization, a national movement really called Workers Strike Back. And Workers Strike Back is uh, calling for a $25 an hour minimum wage. Again, so, so our starting point, again, as you, as you notice, is demands. You have to be concrete because people are not going to, ordinary people, you know, they have, they have a million things stacked against them. They're probably two, three, working two, three jobs. I mean, at least in the US, that's the situation. Um, and so they want to know that it's going to be worth their while. So you have to make it, it's your duty. It's not their obligation, it's your duty to make it clear as, a, as, as, as the leaders of the movement why they should be joining you. And so when we launched Workers Strike Back, we made it very clear. We uh, are fighting for a $25 an hour minimum wage. Medicare for all, obviously that's a big issue in, in the US. And for good union jobs for all, it's also, uh, the other demand is also that Worker Strike Back will be fighting against discrimination and oppression. And then the fifth one is that Worker Strike Back is calling for a new party for working people. So it's like a step towards that, but it specifically goes to the point you raised, which is that you, we, many of us might be from different unions here, and we may not find echo for the kind of fight we want to have within our own union local, but there's gonna be union members in other locals who maybe are on the same page as you, but are looking for a political home as well. So concretely, workers strike back in the United States, it's very small, I don't want to give an exaggerated impression of where it is right now because we've just launched it, but it is concretely, it is, a political home for all workers, union or non-union, who want to fight back. And it doesn't matter, you know, it does, as I said, it doesn't matter if you're in a union or not, and if, it doesn't matter which union you're in. If you want to fight alongside us, and if you agree with our fighting strategy, you know, we're bringing the same ideas that we used in Seattle into this worker strike back national movement. And if you agree with that, then you should be a worker strike back activist. And that's how we have presented it. And we've made it also very clear that you don't have to be a socialist to join Workers Strike Back. If you are a socialist, you should join Socialist Alternative. But if you agree with our demands, then you should become a Workers Strike Back activist. Let's fight together. And just to, again, make it again even more real, through Workers Strike Back, we have been helping, we have been fighting alongside the rank and file of various unions who Unfortunately, you know, whose leadership is a business unionist leadership, and the, but the rank and file, there's a, you know, rank and file caucuses get built. They want to fight back, but they don't have the experience of the strategy and ideas, and we help them. So just to just give you an example, in Seattle, there's a, an organic grocery store chain called PCC. They are unionized with UFCW 3000. Unfortunately, really terrible leadership. And uh, there is a rank and file caucus that, that got formed. Not, we didn't form it. Workers Strike Back didn't form it, but the workers wanted to form it. We called PCC Workers United. But they've made real headway because Workers Strike Back activists have fought alongside them, provided them strategy, explained concrete things to them. Like, you know, for example, saying, you, you should not just have informal conversations with your coworkers. Let's produce a newsletter for the rank and file caucus, and let's take this newsletter to every PCC store and talk to them. And the newsletter actually talks about why you should reject a bad deal from, the, from management. How is it that the Writers Guild won? What, what, is, what is the fighting strategy they had? That sort of thing. You know? So it's, it's a vehicle for political education. 
So Worker Strike Back is able to do this. Uh, and so I think it point in all your questions are pointing towards some organ like that in Canada as well, which main, you know, which doesn't require everybody to sign off on everything. You know, we are going to have disagreements on various things, and that's okay. I mean, in the left, we also need to have an honest and respectful way of debating because there's going to be differences. That's going to happen. Let's have an honest dis discussion and debate. But the things that we do agree on, let's have an organized force that can bring everyone together on it. Thank you very much. I've just been uh, instructed that uh, the food will be gone as of 9, 10 maybe? Nine. Nine. Okay, so it's 22. So let's have a couple of brief questions and, and then I think we have more informal discussion around the food table. So well, I'll, 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 be, I'll be very brief. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for your comments. Uh, you know, looking back, my career as a union member, as a steward, as a you know union leader and a staff you know member, I see the worker solidarity was its highest when we were in strike or some other campaign. You know when we were fighting together, you know the solidarity was the greatest. Um, I think the the second point I want to make I just want to bring back to the the title of the the lecture, Chin Banerjee. Uh, Professor Chen Banerjee lecture in, in anti-racism, wherever Chen is, he's happy at, at what you had to say. He would have loved it. Yeah, thank you. And uh, on that point, I also wanted to commend uh, uh, you, Smear, and Hari Sharma Foundation uh, for hosting this event and paying tributes to uh, uh, Brother Chen. A uh, couple of uh, uh, questions. So, so you talked about uh, fighting, creating that fighting back uh, a spirit, in contrast with collaboration and uh, partnership uh, development. Uh, in California, uh, the the observation is that is that uh, uh, the senators, you know, they were able to pass the assembly. The motion got passed there. It was one person, governor, who vetoed it. Right. So, so, so. Uh, one of my questions for you is, Kshama, what is one concrete action you know, uh, that the, the activists in California uh, uh, can take? So, so one concrete action or strategy, that would be uh, uh, one thing. Second one would be in, uh, in context of the, of the bilateral relationships, whether it's between India and Canada, US, or other countries. There are a lot of pressures, right? And, then, and there are a lot of influences and, and, and pushbacks. So how can uh, we, uh, we move forward the agenda, such as caste, you know, which is not seen as a mainstream issue in US or in Canada. It's, it's, it's affiliated largely with South Asian uh, you know, uh, continent. So in the context of global uh, 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 situations, you know, what are some of the learnings we can take about fighting back the, the resistance and the opposition we're seeing from, from some of the other uh, uh, groups? So, that will help us in terms of formulating uh, a strategy. So, so if, I, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts in terms of what, are, what is one next concrete step, and second one, how can we you know, uh, create a fighting spirit or collaboration in context of global uh, dynamics? Thank you. Yeah, of course. I mean, just in terms of what happened in California, first of all, you're, you're totally right. I mean, first of all, California itself, uh, as some of you may know, is uh, all the, both the houses, of the state legislature are almost 80% Democrat. I mean, honestly, it's, it's so dominated by the Democratic Party. And you, as you said, the bill the, to ban caste discrimination passed both the Assembly and the Senate, but it was one person who vetoed it. But as I was saying before, I don't believe that it was one person. It was a strategy orchestrated by the Democratic Party behind the scenes. and. It was a calculated move. You know, if they wanted to defeat the bill, and for them the strategic question was, what is the low? What is the way that they can? What is the tactic through which they can do it, and get the least amount of blowback? And obviously, then they decided to use Newsom's political capital to do that, and rather than have the Senate or Assembly vote it down. They voted yes, and as, as if everything was going well, 
and then Newsom vetoed it. And in fact, I remember even when the uh, Senate and Assembly were voting yes, we were warning that actually let's not get com complacent. Actually, let's let's build for public meetings and rallies. And it didn't happen, unfortunately. In fact, I can tell you the the pushback and and the then there's just the and there's just the unfortunate lack of political clarity, even among some of the genuine people was so, I mean, it was at such a level that we actually had organized, we had, in, we meaning not just socialist alternative, we had so many of the South Asian activists who are not members of SA in Seattle, but who agreed with us on the fighting strategy. We all together, we had been insisting that let's organize public meetings in San, San Francisco, in the Bay Area, and we had a meeting organized in May, April actually, that was canceled. That's how bad it was, it was canceled by the activists because some of the leaders in the, the NGO, you know, anti-caste movement had spread this rumor that, oh, if you bring socialists from Seattle, the Democrats will vote no. I mean, and I said, well, if they're gonna vote no, they're gonna expose themselves, you know? So let's put the challenge to them. In fact, it's the other way around. In fact, if we have a very public meeting where newspapers are coming and covering it and writing articles about it and saying, we're, you know, all these activists are putting pressure on the Democrats to vote yes, then that actually makes it more likely they, that they will vote yes. They're not gonna like it, but that's not the question. We don't care how they feel. They have to do the right thing, you know? So it was, that's how bad it was that actually a public meeting was canceled, which I have, which I, have I mean, I've been an activist for now 13, 14 years. I've never had that happen before. Uh, so. Uh, I think, first of all, in terms of the next steps, I think all next steps are uh, going to be to no avail if we don't learn the political lessons of why this happened and how we should not replicate a defeat and instead replicate a victory. And first of all, lesson number one is it wasn't just Newsom. Newsom was just their vehicle because that was the lowest political cost for the Democratic Party to have him do that. And in fact, it's also important to remember the bills that actually passed the Senate and Assembly were not the strong bill that we passed in Seattle. In fact, they were watered down in the process. Uh, and they, you know, instead of having a category of, sorry, I'm going into the nitty gritty, but it's necessary to answer this question. Uh, you know, instead of having caste as a separate category that where discrimination is prohibited, as we won in Seattle, which is the strongest way to win it, they put, they changed, it was like that originally, but then they changed it and put it under ancestry. And so what happened, and the reason I'm mentioning this is that that's the bill that got passed by the assembly and the state. And so Newsom, the excuse that he used to veto it was not that I am against, uh, I, I am for caste discrimination or I'm, I'm against uh, ending caste discrimination. He said, oh, I'm all with you, but we don't even need to pass this bill because ancestry is already, uh, discrimination on the basis of ancestry is already prohibited by the law, so this law is not even needed. That's why I'm vetoing it. See, that's the kind of game of smoke and mirrors that the Democrats play, but they won't tell you the real reason that they are vetoing it and the process by which the op they paved the way for vetoing it. Where Newsom doesn't even have to say, uh, if by vetoing it, I'm against the anti-caste movement, all he has to say is, oh, this law is already in place, so we don't have to do it. So unless we understand all this, it's actually not no use if going forward. So that's the first part. And then the second part I'll say is, I think rather than looking to start this in California, which I'd, it's not gonna happen unless we are going to overcome this NGO leadership that complete, led to this complete debacle. If they are going to be again at the helm, then don't expect to win. Instead, I think uh, if other states and provinces in North America, like BC, can learn these lessons and win through a fighting strategy, you know, and what I mean by that is concretely, the BC Federation of Labor passing this, but not just on paper, obviously, but then mobilizing, as we were talking earlier, mobilizing tens of thousands of people to Victoria and decide a rally date, and really put pressure on the MPs, because without that, they're not gonna pass. They're gonna say nice words, but they're not gonna pass it. So, you know, the sort of the similar strategy that we brought to bear in Seattle, and just concretely, I'll say, coming out of this meeting, and again, going to everything that Anjali and uh, Yamina and others uh, were saying is that, coming out of this meeting, let's see if we can organize an organizing meeting, like set up an organizing meeting where activists who want to win this uh, against caste discrimination can come together. And yes, it, it affects only a smaller proportion of the population, but this is BC. I mean, 
you have a huge South Asian working class population here. This is something that other people will get behind. And one of the things we did in Seattle was we educated non-South Asian working class people because you know we said that if you march for Black Lives Matter, then you should care about this issue too because it's all same, I mean, it's oppression. If you're against oppression, then you're against oppression. And we would not have won unless, for example, the Alphabet Workers Union, the uh, union that represents Google workers, also supported us. So we, had, we, we presented it as a working class issue. Okay, well, on that, uh, on that note, I think this is a good uh, uh, moment to, um, to thank Shama for such a wonderful talk, uh, very in inspiring. Um, and uh, I think just shot through with, with ideas that we can, uh, we can use here in, in BC and in Canada. Thanks also to our, our panelists, Michael, Yamina, and Anjali. Thank you very much for being here. And also, thanks for coming, and we have 10 minutes. Um, to have a bit of food and to continue the discussion.